Welcome in, people. Hello. This is Everything Sucks. Sucks. Let's fix it. What the an podcast. awesome name. Great name. <laughs> um, really the main reason you should listen. <laughs> it's just the name. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ben Mayer. I'm Anthony Buono. Uh, we are going to talk some politics today. It's episode three. Today is May 28th. I figured we should also do that. Give the date. Yeah, definitely. Every time. Yeah. It's very important, especially because we are about to start with some current events. Yes. So number one thing on our list is the debt ceiling. We've talked about this for the past two weeks and a huge breakthrough happened last night where the Democrats and the Republicans agreed on a bill in, in theory, it hasn't been passed yet in Congress, Yeah. Um, but it's, all the headlines say bill in principle or deal in principle, right? Sure. Yeah. But it's, it's going to be happening. So yeah. we're not going to default. We're going to be able to borrow more money to pay off our debts. That's all good, but of course, there are strings attached. Yeah. So, to get into the specifics, first of all, as far as what this actually does to the debt ceiling, it's going to increase the debt limit for two years. So, this conversation won't have to happen again Mm -hmm. until two years down the line, 2025. Um, It's capping non-defense spending. So, the deal is going to make it so that government spending stays flat in 2024 and it's limited to a one percent increase in the fiscal year 2025 yeah now what's important this is only the discretionary spending right so it's only like department of education department of energy it's not talking about social security it's not talking talking about medicare Mm -hmm. it's only talking about the discretionary programs that aren't as we'll get into military and veterans benefits. Yes. Those are the two areas that are not capped. Military spending and veteran benefits will be increasing, but Department of Education, Department of Housing Authority, those places will be going de- will be going down as adjusted to inflation. Yes. Yes. They won't be able to increase. Yeah. At the very least. Right. Um so as you just said, defense spending is protected, veterans medical care is protected. The other main thing that we're seeing here is that work requirements for um, government social programs like SNAP, food stamps, and TANF, which is Assistance for Needy Families, has changed. So right now, childless, able-bodied adults from 18 to 49 are able to get food stamps for three months out of every three years unless they are employed at least 20 hours a week or meet other criteria. So basically, People need to be employed at least 20 hours a week Mm -hmm. to be on food stamps in this age range. One thing that this bill is going to do is going to change that 18 to 49 bracket to 18 to 54. Yeah, which honestly, it's not the worst thing. There are many ways that food stamps could have been cut that are way worse than this. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. This This is not like detrimental to the program. Yeah. You know? It's... I think definitely something that would have raised that 20 hours a week number much would have been much worse Yeah, um, than this. Definitely, definitely. Because like, you know, it, it's, it would be much harder to ask somebody, you have to go from part-time to full-time to get food stamps. Yes. Right? That's a way harder cut. And I know some Republicans were even suggesting that. Okay. You know? So yeah. the fact that that's not in there is pretty solid, Yeah, I think. Especially with our current economy, which allows or even encourages so many companies to employ mostly part-time workers yes yeah yeah um i also i wonder like how many people is this even affecting Affecting. yeah yeah how much money is this actually saving you know i don't think i don't honestly i don't even know if republicans know how much it's going to save and i think the congressional budget office will score it eventually and then we'll get that answer but true i don't even think they know yet and look work requirements are not really effective at getting people back to work we kind of have seen that over the past couple years Mm. Um, work requirements don't really incentivize or they do probably incentivize, but they don't actually help people get back to work. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, cause fun fact, people want to work if they're unemployed most of the time. Yeah. They don't want to be unemployed. Yeah. Um, so they're not really effective at that. The only thing is, is it's just cutting the food benefit really, you know? Yes. So yeah, but the fact that all non-defense spending is getting capped to only 1% increases, you know, it, it's going to be kind of it, it, Biden's making a bet because he he's saying he's like, all right, I did enough in my first two years. Mm. I had the American Rescue Plan. I had the Inflation Reduction Act. We passed the infrastructure bill. We've done enough now. 
now, in two years, Democrats are going to win the House, and I'm going to be able to increase the spending as much as I want. So I just got to get through these next two years, Yeah. strike a deal, play nice, and then two years, Democrats will win the House again, and we'll back off to the, mm. back off to the running. That's what I think he's thinking. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot of confidence in the political wins. Well, yeah, Biden definitely is banking on a lot of political confidence for yeah. sure. Yeah, I don't know if I'm that confident, but I'm sure that's what he's banking on right now. Okay, interesting. We'll see. Yeah, we'll I see. I guess. There are a few more things here that I feel like, full disclosure to the audience, this just happened last night. Yeah. Um, so we are pretty new on this information. Yeah, the bill hasn't even been written yet. This is just <laughs> the preliminary like understandings of what's going to be in the bill after it's written, Yeah. which McCarthy has to get out tonight because he i think he wants to vote on it by tuesday mm. and i told you about that 72 hour rule on the last episode any bill that mccarthy wants to bring to the floor yeah he wants to give every legislator two 72 hours to read mm. so he's got to get this thing going yeah yeah mm. okay so we'll see that happen um other things in this article Clawing back unspent COVID-19 relief funds, the deal would rescind unobligated funds from the COVID-19 relief packages that Congress passed to respond to the pandemic. Estimates on how much of this money will be clawed back varies. Okay. Um, so I guess we can't really say anything about that if there's not actual numbers yeah. attached to it. Cutting IRS funding. Um, this is like the one thing we didn't want to happen, but yeah. my understanding is right. It's not that bad um okay gop hmm. i'm not seeing much all all it says i've heard it's ooh. approximately two billion being cut i think i had seen that before as well and if it's only two billion being cut out of the 80 billion that was put towards the irs that's fine that's fine this says the agreement would cancel the total fy 23 staffing funding request ooh. that the house gop says would go for new irs agents okay that's not good. No. That sucks. Yeah. we So we're just going to have to see how... I Yeah, we just have to see how that plays out. We don't have enough information yet to say. Yeah. But that sucks. The whole... Because we, we want a strong IRS agency that's going to be able to take down those people who are avoiding taxes. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's and so much there's tax so avoidance. Much. And it's, it's, it's terrible because our current tax system, like, it, it, you are more likely to be audited if you're poor and a person of color mm -hmm. rather than being rich. And it's because when you're poor and you're a person of color, it's really easy to come after you. Exactly. Because you don't have the lawyers, you don't have the resources. Um, it's easy to catch you in your mistakes. Yeah. You you don't have as complex cash flows with right. a bunch of different sources of income and places to put it. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you need more you need more agents in order to capture the rightful tax revenue mm. from the people who are most prepared and able to pay taxes so the fact that we're losing the agents really stinks yeah it, it's such a it's such a we should um, also say that has a negative effect on the deficit exactly it seems like such just a partisan win that doesn't like there can't be any real rationale behind it besides the argument of Government bureaucracy is ineffective, right. so this is going to waste money. Yeah, that's but all. But there's got. not actual evidence supporting that. Yeah. Okay. Last thing on here: restarts student loan payments. So this I did see a little bit out yeah. of. This says the deal would require borrowers to pay back borrowers to pay back their student loans again after they had been paused since the beginning of the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, but this does say, however, the agreement would maintain Biden's plan to provide up to twenty thousand in debt relief. For qualifying borrowers. Yes. That's huge. This does not... Yeah, McCarthy's deal does not say... He's saying... McCarthy was like, okay, you have to restart the payment, but I'm not going to block you legislatively mm. from doing this student loan repayment thing. The courts might still block it. I don't think it's going to happen. I think the Supreme Court is still going to kill the student loan forgiveness. Yeah. But McCarthy didn't stop it here. Okay. So it's still definitely possible. Um, I think this bill is also going to give the presidency and the executive branch the authority to continue doing these moratorium on student loan payments in the future for other emergencies and the executive branch will have the authority to say when that authority when that emergency. should be used when that emergency is happening okay so they don't have to get permission for congress mm. to put another pause on student loan debt the executive branch can do it alone through an emergency if one happens okay do you think the executive branch might have used that abuse it no i don't but i do definitely i i don't think biden has the will to abuse it 
okay. I think a, I think a more progressive president would have abuse it quote unquote mm. i don't think biden will abuse it okay you know i don't think biden will go through with it proclaiming a fake emergency to do it yeah you know but i can definitely see like in a republican presidency in the future there's a new emergency they're not going to do the student loan payment pause ever again trump doing this student loan payment pause is a one-time act for the republican party they're never going to do it again but now this ensured that a democrat president can do it again okay you know what i mean that's how i think about it that makes sense. Yeah. And maybe a more when a more progressive candidate gets in there, maybe he does abuse the emergency system and does pause it. Yeah. You know, mm. it's possible. I don't know. Interesting. Okay. The, the one other thing I've seen with this is that part of the deal, and I'm not reading this, but part of the deal might double the amount of interest that people have to pay back on student oh, loan debt geez. payments. I don't know if you had seen that. No. Um, that seems Insane. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but I'm assuming that didn't pass since I'm not seeing it. In yeah, I don't here. think I don't think that's in this. But I do know that there was a bill that passed a few a few days ago um, with a lot with some blue dog Democrat support. Mm. Um, and uh, it was to not just start the repayments of the student loans again, but also charge back all the interest that had accumulated since the pause happened. Yeah. Which would be crazy. Yeah. Um, and that did pass the House. That's not going to pass in the Senate. It's not going to go anywhere. But that did pass in the House with mm. some blue dog Democrat support. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because, it, listen, it's a it's a culture war issue now. Now, if you go to college, you're not the working man, you know, and mm. there's a there's a there's a cultural narrative here. That's not true. The working class of the younger generation is getting college educated. OK. You know what I mean? Um, it's becoming more common to be college educated than not at the younger generations. And sure. There's a culture war now where Republican voters aren't don't 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 want to support that anymore. You know. Hmm. You know what do you what do you see for Gen I, Z? I'm curious about how much of Gen Z is college educated versus is not. Um, the the Hmm, it's interesting. I'm seeing a survey result saying as of January of last year, only 51% of Gen Z teens are interested in pursuing college degrees. Well, that's a survey. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We'll see what happens. I don't know if it actually plays out. I'm yeah. not sure if where these... Overall, the trend is obviously more college degrees are mm. happening. Mm. It not. is true that the I feel like it's a misconception amongst uh, people in our bubble, though, that college degrees are more common than not I'm yeah pretty sure because they're not no not in the country they're definitely not yeah no not not even close yeah not even close okay um not even close should we move on yeah so that yeah, that's the debt ceiling topic oh you know what no the, with, the last thing i want to say on the debt ceiling is the political implications for kevin mccarthy so i was i, I was browsing twitter as i do consistently all the time. Yeah. Without fail. And Republicans are pissed. Republicans are pissed. Like the, the Republican base is pissed okay. at McCarthy. The populists in the House mm -hmm. are pissed. I don't know. I don't think McCarthy's going to be able to pass this with Republican votes. This isn't going to pass in the House with Republican support. Mm. It's going to pass in the House with Democrat and then moderate Republican support. The hard right of the Republican Party will not be supporting this. Because yeah. they didn't want a debt limit increase at all. Mm. So he just raised it for two years. This is not what the hard flank of the right wanted at all. Yeah. And they're pissed. Do you think they're going to remove him as speaker? I it's, I don't see another... I don't see how they wouldn't. You know, I, I don't think that there would be another person who would line up and take his job. Yeah. Right? Because we've already seen how that played out this year. For anyone who doesn't know, it, it took the most amount of votes ever to get Speaker McCarthy his job since like... 1870s or something like that yeah so you know i i just don't think there's anyone to replace him but i think there are going to be people who are going to try to take his job from him at least try okay because this is not this is not what his base wanted from this correct his base wanted a 22 percent cut to all federal departments except for military and veteran benefits that they wanted yeah 22 percent cut they got a one percent increase hmm you know what I mean? This yeah. is not what the Republicans wanted. Hmm. 
It's interesting. I, I saw certain progressives also arguing like that they shouldn't that they shouldn't that Democrats shouldn't be budging at all yeah. on any of these concessions because all Democrats have to do is get five Republican votes yeah. in the House to pass it from swing um swing state candidates, swing district candidates whose districts would be massively affected by debt defaults. Right. So do you think there was an opportunity missed there? You know, I, I, I think, I don't know. I think McCarthy did a good job of holding the moderates in line mm. by making this the deal and by kind of caving more to Biden, where I think the Democrat path of pulling off some moderate Republicans is lower because okay. moderates are going to say to the Democrats, like, look, we got your debt ceiling increase for two years. We're just asking you to, you know, free spending at the 2023 level mm. up to 1%. Like, you can't play ball with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, it made it harder for the Democrats to peel off. Okay. If, if McCarthy went in there and was like, no, you're cutting everything by 20%. Yeah. Then I think it may it could have happened. Okay. You know what I mean? I think, sure. I think progressives need to fall in line on this one. I don't think progressives should play ball on this. I think this is... I think this is good enough. Okay. They can they can play ball verbally. Yeah. And and look, there's, say they're against it. There's other ways that Democrats will be fighting back against some of the 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 work requirements for the food stamps in the future. So another like need to pass bill is the farm bill. Um the and in this farm bill, the Democrats will have the opportunity to reinstate a lot of these um uh, a lot of these welfare programs related to nutrition mm. and they're already lining up and they're saying that that we need a parallel track of getting these things back on the table throughout the next few years you know and that this through this way we're going to be able to get our snap benefits back to where they should be from their point of view mm. yeah through the farm bill through the farm bill interesting yeah I am going to be honest. I don't know anything about the farm bill. That's fine. Yeah. I learned about it last night. Cool. So you're chilling. Okay. All right. So that's it. That's the debt ceiling talk. We'll see what happens. Yeah. This is pr might be the last update. Maybe we'll touch on it in the next episode. We probably should once we get a little bit more confirmation on the numbers yeah. of the bill. The vote might be a hectic rodeo. So yeah. we might want to talk about that. Yeah. You know, I, I honestly, that vote, I'm probably going to watch live on CNN because mm. that's gonna be wild yeah yeah that'd be fun okay what's next on our list ukraine ukraine we have two things we want to talk about in ukraine yes um the first i guess we can talk about the fall of bakhmut yeah so this this city bakhmut is in southeast ukraine uh the russians have been there's been intense fighting for it for several months now so basically how when the ukraine war started the Russians like went hard for Kiev at the beginning and they couldn't take that. So they were driven out. They retreated back. Then they sought to uh, infiltrate the Donbass, which is kind of the, the, the region that's right on the Russian border. And they were able to gain some ground, but they haven't been able to capture any like really strategic areas as far as resource production or transportation hubs. So instead, they focused on this this town, the city of Bakhmut, which has a population of about 75,000 people. Uh, they did this because they wanted some kind of victory. And right. it's, it's a big enough city like that it them capturing it is a big city. And they, so they just did this past weekend. Um, meanwhile, Western allies were talking to Ukraine, questioning why they were defending it so hard because it isn't really a hub and so they wondered are these resources and soldiers and weapons and ammunition that you're using to defend Bakhmut is that worth it or should yeah. you be using it somewhere else but some think that they were doing that strategically that they made a stand in Bakhmut to thin Russian forces as much as possible and there are estimates that Ru the Russians lost like at least up to a hundred thousand Russian soldiers wow. were killed or wounded, taken out of the battlefield, um, which is Tragic. obviously crazy. big. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, what the in the meantime, 
what the Ukrainians have been doing, what President Zelensky has been doing, has been going around to all of the Western countries, all of his Western allies, and petitioning for more support, for more weapons, for more ammunition. We just mentioned last week that the U.S. gave permission um, for Ukrainian soldiers to be trained on how to pilot these F-16 fighter jets, yeah. which are really That's highly a advanced. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. And Biden's going to green light other European countries giving the F-16s to Ukraine. Yeah. So he's been collecting all of this weaponry, all of this ammunition, and Ukraine's been building up for a big counteroffensive, is the idea. Um, and I, I will say, Ukraine has been very good at misdirecting people, um, which obviously they have to be like they can't they can't allow information to get out so that the Russians can know when they're going to make their movements right. and make their attacks. But there is an expectation that in the coming months, June, July, Ukraine is going to stage this massive, really quick, sharp counteroffensive to take back the a lot of the land that the Russians have taken in the east. Um, and so I guess we're going to see how that happens. Yeah. As of now, the Russians do have Bakhmut. The Ukrainians are still fighting them from the outside of the city. Uh, but... I guess that's my status update on the war. No, I mean, listen, the the fall of Bakhmut is... I, I was reluctant about Ukrainians holding it for so long as someone who's not a military expert, mm -hmm. but an, an observer of politics and history. It's like, in a war of attrition, I don't think Ukraine wins. I don't think Ukraine wins a war of attrition, uh, attrition where you're just throwing guys in the meat grinder because mm -hmm. Russia's going to have more guys. Russia's totally. going to have more guns. Russia's going to have more ammo. I don't think a war of attrition is the way Ukraine should be fighting. But, you know, with, I, I think there was a lot of, the Russian desire to take Bakhmut was very spiritual. Yeah. It was very, it was for the national confidence. And, you know, almost in the way Hitler's taking of Stalingrad, Hitler's desire to take Stalingrad during World War II mm. wasn't the most strategic thing. You know, he didn't he didn't need that city okay. to, to make it through the Caucasus and get the oil, but he decided to go there because it had Stalin's name attached and it was a real prestigious victory if he won it, you know? Okay. Um and that influenced Stalin's defense because it was his named city and you know, it and I think that was a very similar to this. It was mm -hmm. it was a very spiritual fight on top of the battle rather than strategic. Yeah. You know? I think that makes sense. Yeah. And as, as far as the war of attrition part, I think you're you're very much right that Russia has Ukraine vastly outmanned. Yeah. Um, but because Russian logistics and yeah, you're right. the quality of these soldiers is extremely low, um, it ends up, at least it's possible that these scales can be balanced. Listen, it bit. depends on the Ukraine to Russia loss ratio. Yeah. If it's Ukraine one to one, it's not good. Yeah. If it's Ukraine four to one, might be might be really good for Ukraine. If it's Ukraine six to one, we're talking about a you know a total victory. Yeah. You know. And I I don't know what those numbers are. The exactly. estimates I hear are three to one generally for the war. That's what I've heard. I don't know if I buy that. It's hard to gain understandings of casualty estimates during a war because. No side wants to tell the truth, mm. you know? So it's really hard for me to say yeah. what's true. I don't think it's one-to-one. -one. I definitely think the Russians have taken more casualties. If it's a two-to-one ratio or three-to-one ratio or four, I don't know. But, yeah. yeah. But, so Russia has taken Bakhmut. Mm -hmm. But another development this week was that there has been an attack on Russia proper. There has been a battle inside of Russia itself, not in Ukraine. Um, in the... Belgorod Oblast, which is a city outside of Kharkiv. You might remember Kharkiv from the first couple uh, first couple months of the war. Russia's failure to take Kharkiv was a big hit to, to their campaign, and or their, their time it took to take Kharkiv was a big hit to their campaign. And now, inside of Russia, Belgorod is under attack. Now, who did this attack is a huge cause of controversy. You, the Ukraine government has said it wasn't us. We had nothing to do with this attack. And the United States said we had no planning on this attack. We did not know about this attack that was going on. 
And that's a big deal because the United States doesn't want to give Ukraine weapons to then go in and invade Russia. That's not a that's not the point of the weapons because mm-hmm. that's too much of an escalation for the United States to handle. Mm-hmm. They don't want that. They want their weapons to be used in Ukraine for the defense of Ukraine. They don't want it going into Russian borders. They don't want it on that side. So with this attack going on, the people who who said that they a, a group has claimed responsibility for the assault and it was the Russian Volunteer Corps or the RDK. Um, this militia is Ukrainian partisans who are mix of Ukrainian, mix of Russian inside of Russia who are fighting Russia from the inside. In this attack, they used at least two MRAPs, Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Vehicles. These were supplied from the United States. We don't know how these weapons got in the hands of of this partisan group in Russia. Mm -hmm. The Ukrainian government had said that they never transferred it, and the RDK has said they never requested the transfer. Mm. What they did say was a little spicy, a little, little, little sassy. They said something along the lines, I'm going to paraphrase, like, we found these weapons and this, and this equipment at the local supply store. And that's a play on what Putin said in 2014 when he was asked, where did these troops get the Russian weapons in Crimea? And he said, you can get these weapons at any surplus store. That's the play going on. So was the U.S. involved? Did the Ukraine know that they transferred the weapons? I don't know. But U.S. weapons are being used to attack Russia proper right now. That's pretty crazy. It is crazy. Uh, Do you? Yeah, we, we don't. We just don't know what to believe. Like, we don't know because Ukraine has denied connection to complete the militia group. Totally complete Um, disconnection. So we can't we just can't know when it comes down to it. I I think if I mean, if these are independent people, like an independent group within Russia doing this, I think that's awesome. That's awesome. So cool. It's so dope. Yeah. How do they get these U.S. weapons? (laughs) How do they get these trucks? These these. Mine resistors, like, <laughs> we've only transferred, how many have we transferred? We transferred 600, 500, something like that. It's not like we, we didn't transfer like a fleet of them, like a, mm. like a massive amount. So they are limited in their number that we sent over, but I don't know. I think it's crazy. Yeah. Okay. We sent 500 of them and two of them showed up inside of Russia. How? So that's pretty spicy. Yeah. I don't know. That is. But I hope more stuff like this happens. I hope more. I hope more pockets of Russia. Yeah. Because what's happening now is Russia is 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 pushing so many men into the offensive flank in the south mm-hmm. that their border defenses are relatively thin. Yeah. Because their border defenses, they're thinking they're like Russia's uh, Ukraine isn't going to attack us mm-hmm. because of all these Western stipulations of don't attack Russia proper. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're leaving themselves kind of open to stuff like this. And it's going to make them hard. Their logistics capabilities are going to be a lot harder to manage if they're getting attacked behind them. Yeah. Right? They have to split their attention. They have to split their attention. Yeah. Roads could get start getting damaged if partisans keep doing stuff like this. True. And that's a big detriment. We're talking about war of attrition. If you can't give your ammo to the guys at the front, you're screwed. Totally. It does scare me about raising the nuclear threat, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This raises it more than a lot of things, I think. The fact that Russia internally was attacked. Yes. Yes. It's not good. That's the whole, like, that's the whole point of having nukes is to prevent your country from getting attacked. Yeah. Yeah. And if they do connect that to Ukraine, then... mm. It's not good. It's not good. And there there should be some type of punishment if Ukraine did fully fund these Mm. things from the West. Yeah. I don't know what that punishment looks like because I don't. I don't want to stop the support of the war in Ukraine, but I don't know. I don't know because it, it would not. It would not be good if Ukraine is uh, fully supporting f- armored attacks. Yeah, to an extent, into Russia. Well, it just it seems so difficult. It, it seems crazy to me because Zelensky is not an idiot. Yeah, no, and I can't imagine. I mean, maybe he just did this without talking to Western allies at all. That's not like him so far. It doesn't make sense. And I also feel like they absolutely would have advised him not to do this. Absolutely. They've been hard on that line the whole way through. Yeah. So, yeah. Who knows how they got the trucks. Point is, Russia, I think I think June is going to be a really rough month for them. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be really hard for the Russian military in a couple of days. I think the counterattack is coming and it's going to be crazy. 
I hope so. I hope so, I too. Hope so. I hope so, too. Okay, Afghanistan, oh, yes. Iran. So, look, I don't know too much about this, but I did see some stuff about it. Iran and Afghanistan have been exchanging some heavy fire recently, and the Taliban is threatening to drive all the way to Tehran um, if, if the border crisis and the border disputes aren't settled. Now, what's happening is... Iran is going through a really, really bad drought. Um, 97% of the country is experiencing drought um, this year, uh, which is really bad, obviously, for reasons I don't have to explain. Mm. Um, But, you know, now Afghanistan is also facing drought, and they're fighting over water rights of this specific river. Um, And I think these water wars will become more common as you know, we get into the future, yeah. there's some stuff with Ethiopia and Sudan and Egypt about mm-hmm. water wars too, which I'm not educated about, but I know that water wars are becoming more common. Um, huh. You know, and you know who has the right to build dams on rivers? You know what I mean? Yeah, Those, that's a big deal. So th- there's a lot going on here, and I, I think it's interesting that the Taliban is fighting Iran because now it's like, wait a second, did Biden play 4D chess? And <laughs> <laughs> did we give Taliban, did give Afghanistan back to the Taliban so that they can invade Iran? No, but no, funny. To definitely theorize. not funny to theorize. Um, man, uh, I know. And it's so funny because like they're, the Taliban is now using NATO supplied weapons to attack Iran because oh, wow. they captured so many NATO and so much NATO equipment when they took Afghanistan back. So now they're using NATO equipment to fire on. Mm. It's just hilarious. Yeah, it is. It's hilarious. Uh, I don't like, I don't like water wars. I know. Happening. It's, it's so gross. Dude. It's so dystopic. I know it is dystopic, but it's mm. the world we live in now. It's the world we live in. Bullets yeah. are cheaper than water, I guess. So. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad. Damn. All right. Last thing, um, which is, kind of funny yeah DeSantis announced he was running for president on Twitter like an idiot <laughs> uh crashed did you, did you watch it live no I tried to watch it live and it kept crashing as any of you know who's following DeSantis announcing for president it broke he announced it on Twitter yeah in a Twitter space with Elon Musk which I don't know who that's appealing to who's I told my dad that this was happening my dad is, is a Republican and he's like where do I watch it on Twitter? I'm like, we well, don't really watch it. You listen to it. He's yeah. like, is it on a radio station? I'm like, no, it's not on like radio. You have to make, you have to like go on Twitter and then listen to the radio, the Twitter space. Yeah. He's like, what's a Twitter space? I was like, okay, the average Republican voter, I don't know their age, but they don't know what a Twitter space is. Um, yeah. Exactly. Why would Ron DeSantis do this? That is my question. Is it, is it like to appeal to a younger audience to be like, look, kids, I'm, I'm hip. I guess. Like, I know how to use the tech uh, but, stuff. Well, actually, I think that there is someone in the Ron DeSantis campaign who's trying to make him more appealing to kids. Because, okay. when I say kids, I mean, obviously voting age. But the um, his wife retweeted, the day before he announced, a political article came out. And it's like, Ron DeSantis possibly announcing presidency at this time tomorrow. Mm. And then his wife said, big if true. Okay. What's going? Big if true? Are you... <laughs> Are you like 18 years old? What's yeah. happening right now? 18 years old in like 2015. Yeah. 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 Like what's happening? Big if true. Oh my God. So there, there's something going on. He's trying to be hip and it's not working. During his announcement, I think he was robotic. Mm. Have you? Did you listen to it? No. Okay. All he talked about was COVID. Really? All he talked about was how Trump was Anthony Fauci's bitch for lack of a better term really and trump shouldn't have done lockdowns trump was bad with vaccine stuff trump was bad for trusting fauci interesting so that's his that's what he's running on he's running on that trump mishandled COVID. wow that's what he's running on i i don't i i am very i'm very bearish on desantis yeah i know like i think he has very little chance i think he's in a niche that doesn't work i I might have mentioned this last week on the last episode not too much but um just that he he's trying to be trump um because he feels like he needs trump's base but trump's base is already married to trump himself it's not just about the ideology they're they're a cult of his personality so he's not really going to get many of those and he's not going to capture the other side of Republicans that are um, 
slightly more sane and instead just have different economic views like yeah. the business elites no listen i think trump is I, i'm sorry i think desantis is not gonna i i don't think desantis has it he doesn't have the stuff no. um he raised eight million dollars in 24 hours after his announcement mm -hmm. which is fairly impressive but you know trump raised four million dollars after he got indicted uh exactly so you know there's just there's no way he's going to be able to catch up to the trump war chest yeah money wise i did see news about how uh a pack that's aligned with DeSantis mm -hmm. has like a two hundred million dollar plan really? to push him. No way. Yeah, that's huge. But I mean, this is one of those things where I don't, I don't think it can w do it for him. Like it feels, it feels kind of like a Mike Bloomberg. Yeah, it does. That's a good point. Ploy. Like you're just gonna keep throwing money at a dead horse here. Exactly. Like I, exactly. Like look, I, I don't think DeSantis has the stuff. I don't think he's a good public speaker. No. He's no, not. He he seems like childish and juvenile when he's questioned. Yeah. Um, which Trump, I wouldn't use those words. I mean, I think yeah, he's I say that. he's resistant, but he never seems super like off. Like he doesn't seem like someone is put him off balance or taking out his foundation yes. Yes. he's always very secure in his no you're wrong i'm right no no mm -hmm. and desantis is more like like he, he you see him become really angry and yes, lash out that's a super good point you see him get angrier and that's not good you know i don't think he has the stuff yeah. um i think i mean this is a hot take i think tim scott has a better chance and I, tim scott is a senator from south carolina mm -hmm. he is fairly popular in the Republican base. Uh, he's a black man. Mm -hmm. He has great crossover appeal to Democrat and and uh, independent voters. He really does. I think he is more of a threat, not to Trump, but I think he is like the largest threat that Democrats have. If Republicans get their stuff in line okay. and nominate Tim Scott, yeah, I think Biden's in trouble, but yeah. they're not going to do that. They're going to nominate Trump. And I, th I, I just think it's, I think it's, poor practice for the republicans to spend 200 million dollars on desantis when they could spend 200 million dollars on tim scott and i think have a much better chance about beating biden yeah i think desantis is a bad horse to bet on 100 percent. i don't think he hmm. i do not believe that he's gonna have it at all i agree all right that's Let's current, call events. It current events next up we've got book club um we finished our book which we have been reading People, Power, and Profits by Joseph Stiglitz. Oh, yeah. Now, listen, I'm proud of ourselves. We finished this book in three weeks. Yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah. It was not... I will be. I don't usually read this fast. Neither so do I. It was but not super you know easy. Is? You know what it is? You know what's great about this? And the audience members, you, sh you, should, you should try to read along with us as much as you can because I, I think you learn a lot. And the fact that I have to come here and talk about this book, yeah. it keeps me in check. Like, I can't totally. say, oh, I'll read tomorrow. It's like, oh, man, I got to read tonight because I got to talk about this for like an hour tomorrow. Yeah. Like, I need to know what I'm talking about. Totally. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yes. So first first chapter of this section, chapter eight, restoring <laughs> democracy. So basically, uh, big picture, Stiglitz has gone over what is wrong with the country in the first seven chapters in many different ways. Um, he hit on the kind of the effects of what have, has gone wrong, which is wealth and income inequality, um, making it so that the country as a whole isn't prospering and it's only really the top 1% that has been getting richer and richer and richer. Yeah. Uh, he talked about why that's happened, which includes globalization, um, mismanagement of it, technology uh, advances also being mismanaged market power uh, happening where monopolies are becoming more prominent yes. and then financialization where finance has become an end in itself rather than just a means of achieving something yes those are the four main cancers he says happening in america right now those are the four faults exactly and so now in these last four chapters he focuses much more on how can we fix it yeah how'd you feel about them I feel, let's get to that at the end. Okay. So we'll we'll review the whole book at the end. Okay. We'll get into this. That sounds good. Um, so the first chapter is chapter eight, Restoring Democracy. This is all about how can we change our political systems to respond to the challenges we have. Yeah. So the first big idea is he's trying to establish that um, minority rule has arisen in the country. And he uses three main examples as far as I can tell. Yeah. One is the Electoral College. Obviously. Um, 
which hopefully I don't have to explain, but when presidents are elected, it's based on a number of electors from each state. So presidents have to win states instead of win a popular vote. Yeah. Um, the Senate, which is not represented by the amount of population, it gives an equal number of senators to each state. Yeah. And gerrymandering is the other thing that he talked about, where the lawmakers get to draw districts on the map to determine where representatives come from and what constituencies they represent. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, look, I think the, the Constitution, he says, was designed to protect the minority against the majority. Mm -hmm. That was the design of the Constitution, right? That, that was the kind of the goal, mm -hmm. to be honest, in a lot of ways. Now he's arguing it's run amok. This isn't what the founders intended. This is a problem. No one, they didn't see this coming. They didn't see the situation where, you know, you have a state like Wyoming versus a state like California with these massive population differences on balancing the Senate like this. That wasn't really in their question. Mm -hmm. um, democracy wasn't so much in their mindset, though. I'm not going to say that the founding fathers were like small D Democrats because that's not really true. Mm -hmm. um, but even his point about gerrymandering, I take kind of issue with because Democrats and Republicans gerrymander equally in a lot of ways. Well, that's not really true. Republicans definitely gerrymander more. But you look at a state like Illinois, Illinois it currently did redistricting, and that's a very Democrat state, but it still mm -hmm. votes 40% Republican. But I think it's 14 of the seats are Democrat and three of the seats are Republican. And it can never change because of the way the districts are drawn. So listen, Republicans, Democrats both do it. Republicans do it more. Democrats are more willing to do reforms through independent districting commissions. Um, but yeah, what are those? Uh, so an independent districting commission is the lawmakers don't draw the maps. You give it to a third party okay. made up of three Democrats, three Republicans, and then they draw the maps together. Mm. And then normally it comes down to a more representative flow of how the state as a whole votes. Okay. So there are states that do that. Michigan is a state that does that. There's a couple mm. other ones. So, you know, those are, those are popping up. That makes sense. It's hard, though, because the Democrats don't want to totally unilaterally disarm and then have the Republicans just do it. Sure. You know, so it's a hard, it's a hard mix. Yeah, well... It's, I found this article um, from Brookings that showed that gerrymandering was a really big deal from 2010 to 2016. Yeah, it was massive. Um, it got better. Yeah. And then in 2018 to 2022, it's basically been non-existent. No, yeah. it's got a lot better. Yeah. Um, so that's not an issue. I would say the Electoral College is an issue. Yeah. I say the Electoral College and the Senate are the biggest issues. The Senate is a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Senate was designed to be undemocratic in the first place. The Senate was, you didn't, people didn't vote for their senators prior to the 19th Amendment. Before the 19th yes. Amendment, senators were appointed by state legislatures. Mm -hmm. They were not voted for. So us saying the Senate doesn't have democratic proportionality, the founders would be like, why would they have democratic proportionality? What yeah. are you talking about? You know what I mean? Why would they, what do you mean they don't respond to the people's will? That's the point. We're yeah. not supposed to. The exactly. legislatures appoint them. So, you know, I, I take some, I, I, there's a little bit of constitution loving sure. out of Stiglitz that I don't think is, I mean, maybe it's not. Well, well he's, he's criticizing the Senate though. He's he criticizing it, but it. He, he's saying that this isn't what the founders intended. This is not what the constitution is supposed to be. I see. And I'm saying, no, this is exactly what it's supposed to be. And that's why we need to change it. Okay. You know what I mean? It's a little bit, it's a, yeah. well, I guess he's on a different level. Like yeah. our policies are the same. But just a little bit of difference where we're coming from, I think. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know, and look, it's important to, bless you. Thank it's you. important to keep in mind, like, a lot of policies are very popular. Gun control, larger financial regulation, a higher minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And the reason these things aren't getting, getting implemented is because we have this minority control of the government. Yeah. You know, because if, if we had more popular control, these things would happen right away. Gun control is super popular, mm -hmm. depending on what you say. But even banning assault weapons is at like 60% support now. So, you know, and instead of finding new ways to appeal to people, the right flank of the country is now, or this minority, this rich minority is deciding to change the system itself to work best in their favor. Hmm. You know? Yes. Yes. And that is kind of what his, the big idea of his critique here is, I think. Yeah. So the next thing he goes into after this, misrepresentation of the majority versus minority mm -hmm. is how Republicans are making it harder to vote. Yes. Um, so part of that is disenfranchisement of voters with excessive ID requirements. 
Um, he uses the example of holding votes in the middle of the week when all other countries hold votes on Sunday when Perfect people aren't example. working. Uh, and I, I looked into this. I wanted to check as I was reading through Stiglitz. I wanted to check how accurate a lot of these claims were. Yeah. Republicans disenfranchising voters seems very, very real. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, I, Republicans are trying to limit the amount of people because they're scared when people vote that they'll lose. That's what's happening. Yeah. So what's happening. Totally. Um, and they also do this by like extending the amount of time that it, you have to register before uh, an election comes up. There's just all these things that are, are building up the friction to people voting because they also know that their constituencies, which are generally older, retired people, have a lot of time to sit around and just make sure like they're paying attention to politics and Fox News all the time. So they... It's so easy for them to register far before the election, to walk down to the voting booth on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, they're not worried about, they don't need to mail in their votes. Uh, they already have all the accessibility. Right. So, and also it's like no voting on Sundays in many states. Indiana cl polls clo it's close at 6 p.m. Mm. We're talking about Gary, Indiana in the beginning of this podcast. Indiana polls are closing at 6 p.m. When do you get off work? Five? Yeah. You got to make back to your polling place in an hour. That's some people's whole commute. Totally. So that's a huge problem. And this all became possible because of a Supreme Court decision in 2013. In our next book club, we'll get more into this in depth. Mm. But in 2013, the Supreme Court took away specific aspects of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that allowed states to make their own voting laws without being checked by the federal government. Because in a response to the Civil Rights Act and, and the Civil Rights Movement, the federal government had to approve states in the South making voting changes so that it was within a framework of good, good government, good democracy. Okay. In 2013, that went away. And also, there are districts in the United States that are black majority districts, brown majority districts, specifically because... The Voting Rights Act says that you need minority representation and you can't gerrymander African-American representation out of Congress. Mm. You can't gerrymander it out. Since 2013, that's no longer the case. And huh. you can basically gerrymander them out. And in a lot of areas we saw in Alabama, in, no, in Mississippi, Alabama, Alabama, in this past redistricting cycle in 2020, by proportionality, African Americans should have two congressional seats in Alabama. Ah. But there's only one. And there was a Supreme Court case that tried to get it to two, but the Supreme Court decided not to take it up. It didn't work out. There's only one seat now. But there's oh. all these taking away of minority voting rights mm. that are because of a 2013 court decision. Yeah, it's crazy. Interesting. That is yeah. crazy. So he, he does propose a few reforms, although, albeit very, very briefly, he says six reforms can make a difference here. Um, Voting day a holiday or voting on Sunday, already talked about. Absolutely. Paying people to vote. Um, I'm down for that. I think that's fine. Yeah. I'm trying to think. It's it's what It would definitely cost the government, what, billion dollars most? Probably less than a billion dollars. I mean, if it's, what, $10 per person? Yeah. It's $3 billion, right? Yeah. So. That could work. I mean, 300 million people aren't voting. So oh, true. Yeah. 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 Um, we have making it easier to register, which is extremely vague, I will note. Um, ending disenfranchisement for people who have served prison time. Yeah, that's a huge one. Yes. Because I think it's 7% of African Americans can't vote because they were convicted of something in the past. Yeah. 7% of African American population can't vote. That's insane. Yeah, that is ridiculous. That's insane. I mean, 2.2 I million people. You and I probably both agree that, that prisoners should be able to vote. People yeah. in prison. I think so. I don't. I, I think... Voting is one of those inalienable rights that you'd have to do something like unless it's a violent crime. Mm. You should you sh I, I, I do think you I think if it's a violent crime, I don't think you should have the right to vote, actually. Uh, maybe. But even even that, I mean, I don't think taking away someone's right to vote is like I don't think people are going to prison. And they're like, oh, no, no, I can't vote. Like they're not really worried about losing that. I'm, I think that someone committing a crime does not necessarily change their view on how the country should be run that's a conversation for another time 
Sure. Yeah, that's going to get too in the weeds. But I, I, I definitely go back and forth on the should people in prison be able to vote? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Ending gerrymandering and ensuring a path to citizenship for the dreamers. Yeah. Um, which are people who have grown up in the country, know, uh, know no other home for the U.S. They're immigrants who came here when they were kids, but because they weren't born here, they aren't citizens. Right. Yeah. And I, I agree with mostly all of those. I yeah. think it's good. I don't know. Yeah. How do you feel about mandatory voting? I like it. I think it's good too. Yeah. But I, I, I think I like the paying people to vote more than the mandatory voting because it's, we talk, one of our things that we talk about a lot is carrot versus stick. Yes. And paying people is carrot saying that you have to vote is stick because now you're going to penalize them for not voting. Mm. It gets a little harder. You know what I mean? I guess. I think I, I've read studies that that enforced mandatory voting is extremely effective. No, I believe it. Yeah. Um, and they Australia just, does it, and they, they, they have great voter turnout. Exactly. I mean, like almost everybody. So they can just find people, and then it would cost less for the government. That's true. So I think it could make sense. The only the only problem is kind of goes back to the conversation we had last week about the efficacy of democracy. And if you're forcing a bunch of people to vote, then you're almost certainly going to get more uninformed voters. Yeah. Um, but who knows? That could just end up not really making a difference even. Yeah, who knows? Um, so then then he goes into the checks and balances system. Yep. Um, and he, he he's emphasizing that Trump and Republicans have threatened repeatedly to make it easier to fire federal employees. Now, mm-hmm. this is a problem because we made it kind of difficult to fire federal employees because we don't want the executive branch and the functions of the executive branch to become politicized. Mm -hmm. We want the executive to be functionary. We want it to do what the legislator says, you know? So by cycling in and out these federal employees, every time that there's a new president, you're one having no institutional knowledge in the system Mm -hmm. because there was benefit to that. Yeah. And you're politicizing these processes much more than they should be or were designed to be. Mm. You know, these are supposed to be experts, not people that are just like totally up to the people's will. True. I, see, I didn't even think about it as that. What'd you think I, about I was it? thinking about it as consolidating power. Oh, yeah. that Like just installing more people who are more loyal to the president. Yeah. That's scary. It's super scary. Um, I mean, think about it. If we had more people who were loyal to the president in 2020, yeah. who knows what would have happened? Exactly. It was because we didn't have enough people loyal to him. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I do wonder, like, you you want to have people who are good at their jobs. Oh, yeah. I feel like as, like, the more you get into the weeds learning about politics, the more you learn that the proper execution of policies is usually probably more important than whatever legislation is actually passed. So true. Absolutely. So I do sometimes wonder if execution... I mean, if if this almost can contribute to the argument that the government is a, an inefficient bureaucracy, mm-hmm. and if there is able to be more competition as far as government employment, could that be beneficial? Maybe. I mean, it depends on it depends on who's doing the hiring. I think if you want to change the way federal employees get hired and fired, and make it like if it's a merit system that mm-hmm. becomes a more merit system, that's great. Sure. If you're going to replace this not so great merit system with a political system, it's not good. Uh, if you want to replace this not so great merit system with a better merit system, that's cool. But if we want to replace this not so great merit system with a totally politicized system, I don't think there is actually competition. Okay. You know what I, I mean? Yeah, I think that makes sense. It's almost like turning it into the Supreme Court. Exactly. <laughs> As we transition, as we transition, the next thing Stiglitz goes into. What a tra- look at that! That's something you get from a lot of podcasting experience, man. Look at oh, you. Oh yeah, huge. Um, so so we're talking about uh, like abuses to checks and balances, the need to maintain them. Um, big part of that is him talking about the judiciary, talking about how it's become a partisan mechanism, mm-hmm. and it's obviously not supposed to be. Um, we've talked about this before. It's supposed to be a an unpartisan interpreter of the language of the law. Yeah. Uh, and, but it's it's made several brazen um, decisions in recent years uh, that is kind of showing that it's it's losing this impartial uh, aura yeah. to it. 
that it's no longer like the national consciousness no longer believes that the Supreme Court is impartial, mm -hmm. which is a break. The, the, whether it was true or not, the people generally used to believe that the Supreme Court was this holy institution that was above all of this political strife going on in the House mm -hmm. and the Senate and everything. And that's gone now. Yeah. Yeah. He, he uses Citizens United as, a, yeah. as an example saying companies are people and can be treated as such yeah um it's clearly ridiculous um so i don't know i feel like i should explain i i feel like that's ridiculous yeah because and and stiglitz explains corporations are entities created by the government exactly and thus they can be given rights by the government and exactly. also we just we just know that companies aren't people like they don't need to be given the rights that a person does because a company doesn't suffer or have emotion that they're not human yeah okay i, I didn't need no to. I, listen i don't I, i'm not gonna argue with any of that yeah i'm just gonna emphasize the guy what you just said Look, citizens united definitely broke a lot of our already fragile electoral finance fi financial system okay the, the way that we finance elections was already broken citizens united made it even harder and now that PACs can spend unlimited money and not have to report where the money came from mm -hmm. is a big deal. We should be able to know who's funding this DeSantis PAC that has 200 million bucks. Yes. We should be able to know who's funding the Trump war room and who's funding the Biden campaign. We should know these things. Totally. We should be allowed to know these things. Yeah. Now, what, I, what I just said was kind of incorrect. I, when I say funding the Biden campaign, I don't mean Biden's actual campaign. We know that. But the people... The political action committees that run ads on behalf of Biden without communicating to Biden, we should know who their donors are. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to, to nuance that. But then how do we, how, how do we attack, I don't want to say attack the judges, but how do we change our judicial system to, to either make it less partisan? Yeah. You know, what do we do? And so this is, I kind of had a problem with Stiglitz here because I thought his, I mean, the, the reforms he proposes are one, term limits on judges, and two, it's packing the court. So it's adding Supreme Court justices. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically suggests we should add two more justices. Well, he doesn't say that. Doesn't he? Well, he says, he starts off by saying the Democrats should not pass pack the court. And then he says, we should amend the Constitution to add term limits. And then until that amendment goes into full effect... We should pack the court. Yes. But overall, he doesn't say we should just pack the court. Okay, you're right. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. want to, he doesn't say like Democrats should just put 100 people on the Supreme Court. Yes. Or like put 10 people on the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and hold it there. He wants to tie that to more amendments. Sure. And I just don't think that solves the problem at all. No, I agree. I think, I mean, he also only pro proposes term limits of 20 years, right? Which I think is not responsive enough to the judges not at all. At all. Um, and I think packing the court, he mentions why packing the court would be a bad idea. I agree. Yeah. I think it's a uh, bad idea. It's, it's a slippery slope. Uh, so I don't know. Like, I don't like what he proposes here. Um, uh, I think shorter term limits is something I would definitely agree to. I mean, we've talked about democratizing judges, so they're not appointed yeah. by presidents. Um, I think that, that could work but i i worry because what what we see right now is that democracy drives polarization it's still like judges could end up uh pandering to certain bases more just as much as political candidates Listen, currently do but i know a lot of states currently have elections for their supreme courts mm. wisconsin north carolina these places have elections for their supreme courts and you know, yeah, it's partisan, but it is already partisan. That that that's like kind of my philosophy of sure. it. It's like it's already partisan. Putting term limits doesn't change it. Packing the courts doesn't change it. The only thing we can do is lean into it. The only thing we can do is say, "Yep, the courts are partisan. Who do you want to be on the courts? Do you want liberals or conservative on the courts? It's all partisan anyway, guys. Mm. Who do you want?" And I think that. I think that's the only way forward. So I would like Supreme Court elections every 10 years. That's what I'd want. Okay. That's what I'd want. And mm. look, I don't know the best way to do that. Maybe you say, here's a list of 30 people, pick 10. Mm. 
all non-incumbent. You can all uh, all nonpartisan. You don't have to put a D or R next to their name. Okay. You don't have to put an, a liberal n- nomer oh. or a conservative nomer. Okay. Let their name just be their names. And oh, that's tough too, though, because that's what I was thinking. Like, can we? It seems impossible to expect voters. This is where I like my yeah, problem. It's impossible with to expect no- voters to know thirty people's names. Well, not even just names, but like they're not going to be familiar. I don't think they're going to be familiar with one judge's like record. No, oh, yeah. On decisions they've made, and also like how good that decision has been at interpreting the law. Yeah, it's. So maybe we should change who appoints judges. Yeah, it's almost maybe like the, maybe the House we... of Representatives should appoint judges. Okay, or could we create some kind of third part, like Ugh. some other body? Eh. Or is it just like no matter what we do, partisanship will bleed in? I think is no matter possible. My theory is that no matter what we do, partisanship will bleed in. And to think anything otherwise is to just totally disarm to the people who will be capable of utilizing that partisan power to the fullest extent. Because that's Mm. what I think happened. I think the Republican Party accepted a long time ago that the courts were partisan and they poured millions upon millions of dollars into the Federalist Society, which we've talked about on this show in the past. But Mm -hmm. Federalist Society is a, a, a group of conservative legal scholars and legal theorists and legal organizations that groom people into becoming Supreme Court justices and court justices on the federal level. Mm. Um, And they've been doing that for years. Democrats don't have a Federalist society alternative. Sure. You know what I mean? The liberals don't have that. So that's my issue with the Supreme Court. And um, I don't know what the right answer is. Maybe it's elections. Maybe it's a third party appointing. Maybe the House of Representatives should appoint. Mm. I don't know what it is. That is so hard. Maybe it's five-year terms. Maybe it's five-year terms instead of 20, and the Democrats keeps appointing. Uh, the Democrats. The president keeps appointing. Yeah. I think I think five-year terms could be okay. Just it, the life thing is ridiculous. True. True. Clarence Thomas, having been on the court for about 30 years. Is insane. Is crazy. It's insane. Um, hmm. All right. So now let's get into the power of money. Yes. Let's get into the power of money. So money has totally corrupted our political system. And everybody who is into politics knows this. It's not a secret. There's like a kind of cynicism about it. Like everyone just kind of accepts like, oh, yeah, it's all corrupt anyway. Yes. There's this there's this overwhelming cynicism that totally has totally captured the American population. Like, oh, yeah, everyone's bought off. Everyone's sold off to another country. Every Everyone's owned by a billionaire. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think he, he specifically talks about how like in the in the case of trump it's like okay it's a government by a rent seeker right so it's going to be a government for rent seekers that's a great that's an awesome point yeah Yeah. um and i think like that's not something that's exclusive to trump no generally the rent seekers are the very rich um and so they they wield extreme influence with candidates because their donors um and it's not even just because they're donors it's because these are the people who are making the biggest differences in the constituencies yeah even yeah. um he gives a few examples about oil companies negotiating with the government to get land right yeah. land r- use rights yeah. on the cheap drug companies negotiating so that um when the medicare bill is passed that the government can't negotiate on price. Yeah, which is insane. Pay. Absolutely crazy. So I break that down into two categories. There is moments when the government gives rich people things for nothing, and when the government buys things from rich people for a lot. Yeah, those are the two types of like political corruption that I that I, that I'm thinking about. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is so about the Medicare thing because the Medicare drug pricing is something that we've talked about in America since like 2004. I'm a really big nerd and I recently watched the John Kerry versus George Bush debates from 2004. <laughs> nice. And back then John Kerry was talking about Medicare negotiating drug prices. Really? Yes, that was one of the things he was running on. Luckily, now with the pass of the Inflation Reduction Act under Biden, the the, the presidency and the and and Medicare can now negotiate drug prices. That is okay. now a thing that we can do, which Very will good. reduce Medicare costs by a lot, like at least a hundred billion or something crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, fifty to a hundred billion, somewhere around there. Okay. Big range, but I don't remember it. But point is, that's huge. Yes. And I think that's a theme for all these Stiglitz propositions that we're gonna get through. 
Yes. A lot of it is what Biden's done. And we'll talk about that as we go through. A Definitely. lot of it is what his agenda is and what he's done already, which okay. is kind of crazy to See, think about. I don't, uh, I'm not enough of a nerd to have the connection between the current Biden policies. Sure. So you'll fill me in on that. Yeah. Um, so, so next he goes into the Supreme Court increasing the power of money in politics, which yes. we kind of just talked about. He focuses on Citizens United and how the Supreme Court has decided that PACs don't have to disclose anything about their donors or their actions. Like they don't have to submit a, a balance sheet or where, where their money is gone. Right. Um, and that gives too much power to donors. Yep. Um, it gives donors unlimited power, unlimited donating, power. totally unlimited donating power. Yeah. Um, I can move on from that. No, I mean, I don't really know if I have anything else that I really, the, okay. So the big one now is the revolving door. Oh, oh, I have more for this chapter. Oh, do you? Okay. I, I get to the revolving door in a little bit. Okay. So when we're talking about curbing campaign spending. Yes. PACs should only be able to make contributions to candidate if a... So like, how can we deal with PACs donating all this money? What can we do? Mm -hmm. And there are two big solutions, and I kind of I love both of them. Mm -hmm. Fund campaigns through public dollars and force the, the, force all the cable stations to give equal airtime to each individual candidate. Yes. I think I, those are awesome solutions. I like I like the first, public leveling of I spending. I love that one. Mandatory airtime. I'm okay with that. I wonder if it should be expanded. I, I feel like it should be expanded to other modes of communication, mm, other yeah, media. Totally. I think this should be a place where the government... Um, the government should have a little bit more power with social media companies. Mm -hmm. I feel like there should maybe be like unified campaign accounts oh yeah um that are maybe they can they can maybe they have to pay um the the social media platforms but they're promoted they're mm -hmm. heavily promoted tiktok facebook instagram twitter youtube everything that equally give time of like content time and attention to all the candidates so that their messages can be broadcast to everyone on all platforms. Yeah. So it's not about I. It's not about like candidates aren't spending their money trying to get eyes on these social media platforms. Mm -hmm. They're 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 being given to them equally, and I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the same. That's the same theory as to giving equal airtime, but expanding it to the, the, the new media aspects that we now you know thrive on more than cable yeah right that's where i'm at the, yeah. the only other thing is i wonder if like would it be smart to normalize say the questions that these candidates are asked in say on air if they're going on to interviews or that they're maybe they're given questions they're prompted to answer certain questions and so for for tiktok or something or youtube they make a video as an answer for to each question giving an overview of their that's great their policies Something to, to equalize the playing field and to make it so the people are voting based on the actual policy decisions yeah. rather than who they're most familiar with because of ads. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah. Um, so another thing that we could do to limit campaign spending is, oh, I want to talk about the campaign funds through public dollars for a second here. Mm. That was pushed for by the Democrats back in 2021. It was the For the People's Act, and that was a whole overhaul of the election system and would give federal dollars to campaigns and would like match dollars for every individual who donated to you. The government would match a certain percent of that money. Mm -hmm. So it would like, you know, it, it would small dollar donations would have a bigger impact. Yes, they'd be amplified. Yes. So then the other thing he's talking about is PAC contributions. Currently, PAC contributions only have to be done through the CEO. Only the CEO of a PAC can push through um, a, a, a campaign contribution or, or make these contributions. Now, if a supermajority of boards, if a supermajority was needed to get the donations to the PAC, Citizens United would be able to do a lot less damage. PACs would be able to raise <clears throat> a lot less money. Yeah. I think that's a definitely great way to go. And the political donations would be much more likely to reflect the best interests of 
a company sure. rather than necessarily the personal interest Definitely. of a CEO. Absolutely. Um, which is better. Still probably not great. But Still better. not great, but I definitely think that's better. Yeah. Um, now, next to buy revolving doors. Me too. Uh, which, which I think makes a lot of sense as far as a top. So what Stiglitz means by a revolving door is there is this system where politicians or other executive branch workers will go into Washington and they will do their job, but of course their jobs are limited, their terms are limited, maybe they don't get reelected. But during their terms, they'll be making deals with business people to line up jobs for themselves once they get out of office. And in return, for those having those jobs lined up, they'll include um, or they'll they'll act pro business yeah. while they're in office. Yeah. Stiglitz talks about this as a a huge problem that it's one that enables uh market power basically to work its way into our politics totally. too much. Um my problem here is I don't think he really gave a way to change it. He gave nothing. No, he said the norms need to change. We need to to upgrade the 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 feel like we have to get rid of the stench on our politics so that it's more like more ivory tower esque almost. I know, and I just don't listen. There are other there are things that could. He says cooling off periods need to be extended. That's like his big solution, cooling off periods. Okay, and that's like you can't get a job in this industry for five years after you have this job. Huh. Obama had some things like that. Trump relaxed it a bit, but still had it. Trump didn't totally get rid of it. But this isn't enough because they're just going to wait and then they get a big signing bonus. You know what I mean? So it's like I read one study that found former Senate staffers who have become revolving door lobbyists suffer an average 24% drop in generated revenue when their previous employer leaves the Senate. So oh, so the, people are losing drastic amounts of money when the senator that they worked for leaves the Senate because they lose all their power. The person ah. who, they, yeah. So that's been found to happen. This is wow. so it's like really in bed with people's salaries. Mm. It's like a reason that they're getting employed. They're losing a quarter of their salaries after their boss leaves the Senate. That's crazy. Their ex boss leaves the Senate. So I don't know what the answer to the revolving door is. I don't know. You can't have you can't have total federal pensions for everybody who was ever in the Treasury Department. So you can't go work on Wall Street and we're going to pay you out forever. You can't do that. Mm. So I don't know That's what the so answer hard. is, but the revolving door is the biggest problem. You think so? I think it's one of the biggest problems because how how can we trust these people to take the collective act, to take the opinions of the collective, which is their job as government, mm -hmm. when they still have such an awful amount of self interest right at their fingertips? Mm -hmm. It's so funny because this is hmm, hmm. something that I uh, I mentioned on our debate last week is like the idea of paying government officials way way more yeah um right now uh, i mean the the most well-paid executive is the president at four hundred thousand dollars a year uh which is a good salary yeah but it's also like good it, it's not even i don't think it's even a top one percent your top one percent 350 is top one percent i think okay so you're just about top one percent okay um yeah but i think yeah. I think them and and legislature legislators should be much better paid because I do feel like I mean I don't know this is something I where agree. I don't I don't have evidence on so this is speculation but I feel like that could reduce corruption that does so I I just want to put that out there no that that that's been an idea for a while that a salary will higher salaries and better pay mm. will reduce corruption because there's less need for the corruption. Mm. Um, but I, I listen, I, I don't know what the answer is to the revolving door system. Honestly, maybe if you work for the Treasury Department, maybe you shouldn't be allowed to work on Wall Street. Or maybe you're only allowed to work for nonprofits. Or, mm, you know what I mean? Like sure. maybe if you're going to dedicate your life to public service, maybe you do get a little bit of a pension of like $30,000 $30, a year. And we say, okay, now you don't get to be a Wall Street hedge funder anymore. That's not allowed. And now you can only work for nonprofits going forward. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's it's just hard to to say that because that's very limiting. No, it's super very limiting. And then who's going to want to do these jobs? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Who's going to want to do the jobs? So yeah, especially, it's hard, especially when they have a necessary uh, finite lifespan. Right. Yeah. 
so it's just it's just difficult and i i what the, the same way i feel trapped to know the answer i feel like i can i, I feel stiglitz not knowing what to do here yeah i feel that from him too exactly like he's he knows it's a problem and he's it's upsetting that he doesn't really know the the solution yeah exactly okay um exactly so the next thing he has a section called the need for a new movement yeah which i think is kind of very meh um kind of gray matter it feels it's very nebulous it's very broad it's very much like okay we have we have multiple progressive movements with trans activism, with reproductive health care, with black and brown activism. We need to unite all of these and have a v- solid voting block. And yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah of like, course. Sure. Sure. Um, but and like I would expect that's already being like I, I would expect there's already a lot of cooperation or at the very least like these these coalitions are voting for the same they're supporting the same candidates Listen, are, there, are, are there some progressive movements that don't believe in voting yes do they need to get over themselves yes okay is that like i don't know it's just hard it seems to me that this chapter or this section for him is much like okay republicans have this big voting block but there's all these tensions in there we have working class white people voting with the big business owner hedge fund guys Mm. and that constant conflict will mean that their coalition will break apart someday but the progressive voting base has all these different beliefs about challenging power and because of that we should never be broken it's like yeah but it sounds like it's like a political speech rather than like a big an actual prescription yeah because it's like no i agree with you but where's this what's what should we do yeah and there isn't a really what should we do his honestly this, this section just kind of reads to me like go vote exactly and like yeah we should go vote exactly i don't know that's hard you know and then the last thing i have here is talking about wealth in our democracy and this is very obvious no democracy can function if the wealth divide in the country is too large no tinkering with any of our rules will matter because wealth will always find a way to corrupt to break the rule Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much we try to make the system nonpartisan. it doesn't matter how many how many years the term limits is none of that matters because wealth can always buy power. Mm-hmm. And so we need to attack wealth and we need to attack power. Good example is Murdoch with Fox News. Obviously, mm-hmm. that is a huge example of the wealth buying influence. And, you know, we, far right movements are very prominent in Europe right now, in America. Australia doesn't have a far right movement. And it's because they don't really have a far right media ecosystem. Really? Yeah. They don't have a Murdoch in Australia. Interesting. They don't have an equivalent. So, and, okay. and they don't have a far right movement. And I think that's really interesting because it really is that astroturfed. Yeah. It's that. And I say astroturfed. It's like, it's like fake grass. You know, it's like someone grew it out of nothing. Yes. And that's what's happening with these far right movements, I believe. I think they're all grown out of nothing. Sure. All right. Um, Which transitions very well into the next chapter. Chapter nine is restoring a dynamic economy with jobs and opportunity for all. Yes. Um, So the first section he's talking about growth and productivity uh i i don't have any notes here until it gets to the labor force growth and participation yeah i mean the only thing i have is talking about the only thing i have is talking about the labor force participation rate yeah and the labor force partition pay uh partition rate took a big hit during COVID, obviously and it's steadily been increasing back up Mm -hmm. um but it's still lower than where it was in the 90s by a substantial margin. So it used to be around 67% in the 90s. And we're currently sitting at like 63%. So okay. we have a 4% difference in our labor force participation rate. Okay. Um, that's not good. Is this amongst all adults? Like what is this percentage taken out of? You yeah, know? the labor force participation rate is people between the ages of 18 and 64 who are currently working, looking for work and can't currently looking for work. Okay. And they're not fully employed? No, that's the uh, the unemployment rate will be people who are... F- Wait, no, no, I'm sorry. This is incorrect. The labor force participation rate is everybody ages 18. Wait, what is it? Oh, it's no. probably everyone. No, I'm wrong. Like everyone know. 18 and up, I assume. Because that's the only way it can be so low. And what Stiglitz specifically yeah, talks probably. about is accommodating older workers yeah. who are usually shuttled out um, because of ageism. 
Yeah. Honestly. Labor force participation rate represents the number of people in the labor force as a percent of the civilian non-institutional population. So, yeah. Okay. The participant rate is the percentage of the population that is either working or actively looking for work. Okay. 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 Um, so 63% is pretty low. He, he makes a few suggestions, including supporting mothers better to include more women who are starting families in the labor force. Yep. Which I totally agree with. Oh, yeah. Um, accommodating older workers. And he talks about needing a healthier population. Yeah. Which we've talked about earlier in this book as having an unhealthy population being an effect of the economic inequality and inability to find opportunity definitely in the country uh here he's talking about it also as a cause uh-huh. yeah i have one more note on the labor force participation rate when with regards to women having trouble entering the labor force because of child care sure when we look at <clears throat> the ages of 24 to 55 men have a labor force participation rate of 90 percent 24 55 wow women 77 it's a massive disparity yeah and that's directly because of you know the difficulty the difficulty when we go to 16 plus it's at 68 for for men 57 for women for 16 plus but for the prime working age 24 55 90 percent men 70 77 percent women Mm. okay i don't think he really talks about well he does talk about a few family-friendly policies here greater flexibility of hours um more support for child care better family leave policies but they're they're all generic they're all generic. I think, answers. listen, I think Biden has pushed for some really good daycare policies. Yes. Um, capping the cost of daycare to 7% of your income, I think is awesome. Mm-hmm. There's some cases where it's actually cheaper for a woman not to go to work because childcare will exceed her salary. That's insane. Yeah. It's cheaper for a woman to stay home and work than actually go get a job because of childcare being so expensive. Yeah. So having childcare capped at 7%. Of your income, I think, is a pretty good idea. Yeah. This is something um, I, I read an article a, a few weeks back about how um, birth rates amongst women, amongst more educated women, have actually been rising since really? COVID because more companies are allowing for more flexible work arrangements. That's amazing. And so if women can stay at home while they do their work and also take care of their kid, uh huh, they're totally fine. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I think that's a great uh product of the pandemic. Yeah, that's really good. Um then uh, the next thing I have is talking about monopolies and their incentive um to grow economic productivity. Mm. Um so I absolutely agree that we need to curb market power to address the productivity crisis um, and also increase our infrastructure spending. Um, Biden's passing of the infrastructure bill last year, um, we'll see what the effects of that over the coming decade. I mean, mm. we're, we're lucky we got something like that passed. I'm sure it's going to do a lot of good, um, and we'll see what we're able to return on that. But how do we tackle the market power is a massive conversation that he doesn't really get at. No, He just says we need to tackle it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, how do we tackle it? Yeah. And and I think, I guess you can make the, like, you can draw the connection between how reducing market power will increase productivity. But I don't, I feel like he doesn't explicitly say that. Well, he did that in chapter three. Sure. Right. Sure. So I, I guess in that case, I just feel like this section was kind of unnecessary. I agree. Like it didn't really add anything. I, I don't think it added, any, added anything. And I think that kind of is going to happen a little bit going forward yeah exactly so the last section here is creating a learning society which again he's touched on before but it's like we should make large public investments Mm -hmm. in research uh something that he mentioned with the trump tax cuts is that they reduced that public investment deferred it to hopefully something the private sector would do stiglitz says that's a bad idea because even if the private first of all the private sector won't invest as much as we need right because they'll only invest as profit seek for profit seeking motives rather than for knowledge seeking motives right deepen the moat expand the moat yes we talked about make it harder for other people to enter that's where they're going to research exactly exactly and otherwise they're they're incentivized to hoard their knowledge to hide it to not share it um and that 
really limits our society's ability to move forward. Exactly. You know, they're, they're going to hide the they're going to hide this great research behind closed doors and it's going to limit what we're going to be able to really get out of it. Yeah. And that's why public investment in research and development is so necessary. And, you know, the new tax law is taxing or Trump's tax law. It was taxing research universities for the first time while it was giving tax breaks to real estate speculators. So this is a good example of how the Trump tax cut kind of frames the its belief in the country's goals mm. and what it wants the country to look like. Do you want it to be a land for renters or yeah. do you want it to be a land for creators? Yes. And the Trump tax policy is a, is a, is a policy for and by renters, you know? Mm. Yeah. Sure. So the other thing I have here is that he, he mentions a need for open borders as far as knowledge. Yeah. So that we can help the world increase and the world can help us. Absolutely. And I don't have to spend much time on that. No, I totally agree with all that stuff. You know, publicly fund the research, keep the country country open to from people from abroad and new ideas. And I absolutely agree. Yeah. You know, and we have to increase taxes on corporations and spend more money on US infrastructure. And that's it's interesting because I basically summarized this point, this section, as we need to increase taxes on corporations, spend more money on U.S. infrastructure, and invest in technology and science. Well, Biden did all of that. Biden increased the taxes on corporations by implementing the 15% minimum corporate tax rate for any corporation having profits to shareholders of above $1 billion. We passed an infrastructure bill where we're spending more money on infrastructure than we have since Eisenhower. And we passed the CHIPS Act where we're investing in technology and science at a rate we've never done. Biden did the three things. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. That's pretty damn nice. It's pretty damn nice. So it's something. But now we talk about this a lot with the book. We've transitioned from an agricultural society to a manufacturing society. What we're doing now is we're transitioning from a manufacturing society into a serviced economy, into a post-industrial world. Yes. And somebody is driving the car. Whether it's the government, whether it's Elon Musk, mm -hmm. somebody's driving it. We need, the people need somebody who is responsible to us driving it. Mm -hmm. We need somebody who is going to steer the car in the best direction for the people driving the car, not some private guy. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, and AKA. that's what it gets into in the next chapter, the next section. Yeah. The government. We need the government to have a heavy hand in this transition. Um, so he talks about two things I have here, active labor market policies Absolutely. and industrial policy. So active labor market policies, is, he says, they help retrain individuals for new jobs, help them find new employment. Um, I, I also interpret this as reducing unemployment, as, as supporting people through unemployment yeah. or or what he will mention later i guess we'll get to this is like providing government jobs mm -hmm. for them yeah a federal jobs guarantee which i'm a huge supporter of yes i love that if someone too. wants a job give them a job i yeah. love that idea totally um and then industrial policy which is basically laying out certain carrots or sticks for carrots as in in tax breaks or incentive sticks as in um excess taxes um one good example he talks about is tax on carbon emissions yeah. um, to influence the direction that these companies go in terms of what they're producing, how they're interacting with their consumers mm -hmm. and how they're employing people. And he notes that this industrial policy needs to be focused around places, not just people. Yes. Because we have places in this country where people have roots. Mm -hmm. They don't want to lose community bonds. We've yep. learned that social bonds and community involvement is one of the largest predictors of a long and happy life. We don't want to lose that. Mm -hmm. And I think the CHIPS Act does good with that. I think it encourages a lot of production and investment, even in rural places around Ohio, you know? Especially in rural Especially, places. Especially, you know, rural places in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's a really great aspect mm. of that. I think that is a spatially cognizant industrial policy move. Mm. Um, and I, I was really happy to see that he gave the example of Manchester in the United Kingdom, um, that was able to trans that was able to transition from a textile hub to an education center. And it was through government intervention that it was able to accomplish that transition. Um, yes. and that's what we're going to have to do going forward. Yes. You it, know, this is a, it's a very specific antidote to like the industrial jobs that were lost to globalization. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to bring it back to Gary. Yeah. We need an industrial policy that's going to tell the people of Gary that 
we're coming to help. Yeah. We're not going to ask you to go move to San Francisco where houses are super expensive and cause more problems to the housing crisis. We're going to say, stay where you are. We're coming to get you. Yeah. You know, exactly. Um, okay. Next up, I have social protection yep. being the next big thing. So, so Stiglitz says there are gaps in our social insurance. It's not good enough and we need to fix it. I'm very much on board with all of this. Definitely. He says we need to reform our unemployment insurance with um, better payments, which means bigger payments for longer periods and more people covered. Right now, our unemployment insurance plan looks like you can be unemployed for six months and get payments. For those six months, you get paid half of what you were making yeah. on a weekly basis before you lost your job. Um I don't remember. Does Stiglitz talk about like number wise what he what he wants? No. Mm. No. He does say so he doesn't say what do what should what does he say? He does say talk about income contingent loans. Yes, I don't like these at all. No. No. I no. think they're terrible. Okay. Talk to so, me. So so one of the things he talks about is possibly giving the long-term unemployed the ability to borrow against their future earnings to support their family in the moment. I mean, to me, this is what I wrote. When I, when I read this, this is what I wrote. This seems like an absolutely awful idea. <laughs> if totally, if, 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 wait, what did I say this? With, even with completely low interest rates, maybe. So if they have totally low interest rates, maybe. But this may stick people with low skills and low incomes with higher income tax for the rest of their life. And I say with a higher income tax because basically this is what this is. That's how I view it. Hmm. I view that this is going to be like, okay, you were unemployed for this period of time. That's cool. Now you have a 2% higher income tax than anybody else because you borrowed against your earnings and now you have to pay back that loan. Hmm. You know what I mean? So you just think the the I don't think Americans are, I don't think Americans are financially literate enough to not abuse that system terribly. How would they abuse it? By using that to either stay unemployed for too long, thinking that they'll be able to pay it back, no problem. Okay. Or, I mean, that's how they would abuse it. Okay. Do you have another idea for how to handle long-term unemployment? Is it just is it just we need more funding so that we can extend this insurance past the six month period that it currently is at i think the initial unemployment that you get should be higher than 50 percent, and then it tapers off as it goes on so oh. it goes down from like 50 or from 70 to 60 to 50 to 40 mm. and then goes away maybe for like a year um but i like his other proposal where he's talking about paying people to go back to work where the government will give you basically give you a sign on bonus if you go get a job mm -hmm. to encourage people back into the labor market. Because he says that individuals get an unrealistic expectation of what they should get from their next job after they're laid off. They don't want to take a lower salary or they think that they should get a salary increase after they've had more experience. Mm. But the federal government giving a signing bonus to if you go get a job will encourage people to get out there more, which I think would alleviate a lot of un long term unemployment. Okay. Yeah. You know, I like that. Yeah. But also, the real answer for unemployment is federal jobs guarantee, which doesn't include here. No, that includes be the next later. chapter. Yeah. Um, but that's... We'll definitely talk about that. Yeah. Uh, the... Oh, well, then he has the other solution. Which is... The UBI. Yes. The UBI, the universal basic income. Well, it was interesting because he... So he talks about UBI. He gives a lot of information about it. A financial... So... Universal basic income is a financial stipend for everyone. Um, you don't need to work a job. There are no requirements. You just get paid a certain amount of money every month or every mm -hmm. two weeks or whatever. Um, he talks about good aspects, what supporters talk about, which is like it's going to dampen the negative effects of an economy that's trending towards automation, which is more applicable now than ever with Definitely. how much AI is um, growing. It would increase equality because it would redistribute money via taxes, of course. It would provide a backstop for people who fail to get jobs. It would mean that we really don't need this unemployment insurance. The UBI would be... Yeah, it would. It, he's saying it could replace a lot of social insurance programs that we currently have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But then he... So it's funny because he 
takes another side of the argument. He says, I don't believe simply providing income is the right approach. For most people, work is an important part of life. Um, and I really disagree with this point. It's interesting because I really agree with that point. Okay. I, I don't disagree that work is an important part of life. What I disagree with is the idea that UBI will stop people from working. Like we, you, you've talked to me several times about how people work not just to live. Right. Um, and he, so what he's proposing is we can, we'd be okay with shortening the work, work week. What I'm saying is I don't think UBI will make it so that people don't work. Like, I feel like that's almost clear in his point. And UBI doesn't make people not work. It exactly. Doesn't. I know that. Yeah. He says for most people, work is an important part of life. If that's true, they're going to keep working nonetheless. No, and we can see UBI experiments in Canada and Finland that resulted in higher employment rates than places that didn't have UBI. Yes. So we know that UBI is not taking people out of the labor market. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, but I don't think UBI, I, I don't, I don't think UBI, I just don't think UBI is the answer to all of our, like, I don't, I don't like the idea of replacing our show, social insurance programs with UBI. Mm. That's kind of my main thing against it. I, I'm not like totally against it, against it, but like, I wouldn't want to replace food stamps with UBI. I wouldn't want to replace housing assistance with UBI. Because I think that rent seekers will be able to abuse that money much easier than they would be able to abuse abuse food stamps. Do you know what I mean by that? Like it would be yeah yeah yeah. A rent seeker will see a UBI and be like, oh, I just know you got a two thousand dollar raise from the government. Well, guess what? You need housing to live. Mm. I'm increasing my rent. So now, or same thing with pharmaceuticals. They're going to increase their rent. Or same thing with whatever, because mm. it's more money that can just be sucked out. And I I don't think there's consumer protections to protect people from stuff like that. And that's my issue with UBI. I think it leaves too much up to the market. It tells people, okay, you just need access to the market and then you're going to be fine. So here's all the access you need, but the market's the problem. It's yeah. not access to the market. I, I wonder, because that's, that's kind of like UBI will drive inflation. Yeah, totally. But I've, I've read that it doesn't, that in experiments like the ones in Canada, like that you're mentioning, it doesn't end up doing that. And I, I think it's because you're not actually adding any money into the economy. You're just redistributing it. And so I had the same idea that I would expect it to inflate prices of basic need goods mm -hmm. like food and housing. Um, and I feel stupid for not being able to give you a, bit, a better reason of why it's not. All I do remember is reading that it doesn't. It doesn't drive inflation. Okay. So you can call bullshit on me, but hopefully maybe we could look into this later. We'll look into that offline. Can confirm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because cool. it does sound cool. It sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I'll just emphasize that with AI, like where AI is going, it could increase human productivity by so many times. I, I don't want to pretend that I'm deep into the, the science, the papers here of how much it could do that, but it will really ramp up our productivity output. Totally. But it will also almost certainly, like in a lot of cases, reduce the number of workers that are needed. Mm -hmm. So UBI to me seems really fitting for this current moment. I understand. Yeah. Um, okay. So next section is decent jobs with good working conditions. He talks about ensuring good or ensuring full employment, uh, which he, like, largely here, it's just a discussion of the problem rather than the solution. And I still think that's because he's going to get to the solution later. Um, but I specifically wrote down, like, he doesn't say how to ensure full employment in this section. Yeah, I mean, he, he talks about how to, he, yeah, he just kind of talks about how we don't have full employment currently how we didn't have full employment after the 2008 recession and how we should have had better fiscal policy to ensure that we did. He's saying, he also talks about how not having full employment leads to poor political moments. And that's what we, it makes people open to demagogues who will target migrants, you know, for fear that they'll take their jobs. And then people don't trust economists who tell them that all their job losses to globalization will eventually be replaced with better jobs. They don't trust any of that, mm -hmm. um, you know, because the job is the most important thing that you have. Um, it's it, it, it's how you live. You know what I mean? Exactly. Um, and, and anything that's going to threaten that is 
um, going to be able to be abused by demagogues for sure. Yes. You totally. know, and I think so then it gets into this, that we need to recognize a new right in America, the right to a job. Yeah. The government should be in the business of being the boss of last resort. Mm -hmm. They should be the boss of last resort. Um, there is an example he cited in India uh, where they've been successful by giving all rural citizens who wanted a job for 100 days mm -hmm. by doing uh, uh, construction work. And if a poor nation like India can afford it, so can we. You yeah. know? And what's going to be great about an American federal jobs guarantee is we can have these jobs compete with private sector jobs, and the private sector jobs will have to improve to get people out of the public sector jobs. Yeah. This is where I am. I wonder about specifics of, of that point, because... If, say, you want public sector jobs to fill in for construction, development, mm -hmm. um, how much management do you need? Like, how much infrastructure do you need to build up in place to enable yeah. that? Uh, so I, I just, I would just be curious. Like, what's the long-term cost of, like, do you have to have a manager around like every house district in the country that's going to be prepared to hire. Yeah. Like, is that how that works? I, I mean, don't know. Probably multiple. Like, right. Because you also need managers at each site. And there are right. like, even if there are, there are some amount of jobs that can go to unskilled labor, there are skilled, knowledgeable people that you almost certainly do need managing those positions. Yeah. Um, so it gets, it gets harder when you get into the specifics. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I mean, the idea sounds great yeah i think i think obviously the idea sounds great i think that its implementation isn't as difficult um as it seems um but i it, it's been a fight for a long time to have a federal jobs guarantee it's been mm -hmm. a fight for a long time you know the new deal did something similar with the civilian um uh the ccc the civilian something core okay um and i would like to see something similar with the sil like a civilian climate core where sure. we can have an aspect of the U.S. government that is always going to be able to hire people for the sake of ta tackling climate change. Mm. Currently, right now, where we're at in the United States with being at like full employment, maybe we don't need this type of jobs program, sure. but in the future, definitely. Well, I think something that like allocated an amount of the budget and got the money via taxes to create or to, to enable full employment via the government and then have some plan, some elastic plan, so that money, if it didn't need to be used, mm -hmm. could be diverted back sure. into existing government programs. Yeah, that's great. That makes sense. Perfect. Yeah. That's perfect sense. You know. Okay, so um, he also says, so in the next section, or, or he, he mentions a bunch of these other things that we've already touched on, as far as changes in our fiscal policy that yeah. we should tax carbon emissions, we should invest in infrastructure, we should research investment, we should... Uh, the one other thing that we haven't talked about yet is that we should create a bank. Oh, yes. For the all of this. The infrastructure bank. Yes. Which I'm a huge supporter of yeah. creating an infrastructure bank. I like that as well. It means that the government can't be exploited by private financial institutions mm -hmm. um, and instead will have its own financial system to fund all these projects. In the beginning of the Biden administration, Joe Manchin, who was a senator from West Virginia, he's probably the most conservative Democrat in the Democratic caucus in the Senate, was in support of an infrastructure bank. And I was so excited. Yeah. Didn't happen. But I was very excited that he was in support of that at the time. All right. Next thing is talking about opportunity and social justice. Um, mm -hmm. So... Currently, a fifth of children in this country grow up in poverty. These kids will obviously not be able to have the same type of opportunities that we had, obviously. Um, social justice needs to be a goal of the United States government. And one aspect of addressing this is, so there, there's two aspects. The first one we're going to talk about is pre-distribution income. Now, what is pre-distribution income? That is the distribution of market income. That is before the government gets involved. And how can we do this? Um, and why would we want to do this? First, it lessens the burden of redistribution, which I think is a desirable goal. And then it w we need to increase the minimum wage. Um, and then for post-distribution stuff, I think we should double the earned income tax credit and reinstate the child tax credit as created by the American Rescue Plan Act. You know, so, and these are these are things that will encourage family development, um, encourage, uh, you know, 
make it easier for people to live off the job that they have. Um, the, the child tax credit thing was one of the best things to ever happen in this country in the last 50 years. It's you a know, shame it wasn't reinstated. You know what's really interesting is is the Trump tax cuts increased the child tax credit. It did. Yeah. Um, it did. Doubled it. And then this Biden American Rescue Plan Act increased it by another thousand. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It was also different because the child tax credit, the way that it was working under Biden was it was a monthly payment where with with Trump's child tax credit, it just showed up in your tax return mm. where it was like, Biden, you got to check every day, every month in the mail mm. where Trump, it was like a result of your tax return, which is like a, it's a philosophical difference because it's not just a tax credit anymore. Now it's like a social program. Okay. You know what I mean? Sure. You know, having the money one time every year is different from seeing it in your mailbox every month. Yeah. You know? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So he also talks about how our financial system is completely structured around inequity um, and how the bottom pay higher interest when they take loans out mm -hmm. and then get low interest when they are putting put their money back in the bank. Honestly, this is like on track with a bank's incentives. You know, this isn't banks being bad for their for being bad sake, this is what a bank would do. They wouldn't give money to somebody they don't think is going to be able to pay it back. Right? Yeah. So it's hard for me to say like what the solution is to that. I also don't know. Like he never says what the, like what's what's even the proposed solution possibly to that. Does he does he talk about like establishing the national bank for people? Oh yes, in that he, case? he does talk about that. I feel like he talked about that previously. Though. I don't think he talked about it in this chapter. I don't remember. It, it might not be. I'm. I honestly don't know. I feel like you either I didn't take notes on this or you jumped to somewhere that I haven't found in my notes. Oh, no. Um, right. It's all right. No, it's all right. Yeah. What yeah. I, I what I have for this section. What do you have next? Um, so he talks about increasing the minimum wage. Yep. Providing an earned income tax credit. Love that. Which I do love. Weirdly enough, something that Trump also campaigned on mm -hmm. increasing in his tax cuts act but it didn't end up coming to fruition i wonder why i don't know why you think it was he was just lying about it because republicans barely supported the earned income tax credit when they were when it was implemented okay so why would they why would why would we, they do it now you know what i mean and what and so an earned income tax credit is supposed to basically it's supposed to be exactly opposed to rent seeking it's like this is a tax credit you get from getting paid for work that you do rather than income you get from it's a great way to look ownership at it. yeah yeah this is a specific tax credit you get for doing labor yes um okay those are the two i have then it talks about the role of intergenerational transmission yes of advantage and disadvantage yes exactly. so the biggest thing he talks about here is this is about beefing up education mm -hmm. it's about giving teachers Better salaries, higher salaries, and better working conditions, which can include smaller class sizes. Hugely on board for this. Yep. Um, I was reminded of a podcast that I listened to recently talking about China, mm -hmm. talking about government workers in China, and how government work is some of the most prestigious jobs that exist in China. Wow. That seems like a norm shift that is hugely important yeah for us i totally agree right now the prestigious jobs are sure you, you can say lawyer but lawyers might be the people who are specifically helping the rent seekers but you have like bankers as prestigious jobs um doctors sure, and other ones but consultants yes the the highest money making jobs are the ones that are most practiced at exploiting the poor and redirecting it to the rich yeah and so to pay teachers more could start to transition that because well, i've said so many times here it's like and so is he so many young talented amazingly bright people get sucked into the rent seeking world yeah and if we could just take out a portion of those and get them into teaching or get them into the public sector it could be a totally different situation totally you know and we're not going to get those high quality top tier candidates if we pay them like garbage yeah, exactly. We, we just need 
there does need to be a narrative shift around this. And I wonder if part of that comes in like media portrayals as well. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're being a teacher is not glamorized. No, no. So the next thing he talks about is racial and gender discrimination. Yep. Yep. So while the social consequences are uh, social consequences are obvious, it also affects our economic vi- uh, v- vitality, mm-hmm. as those who suffer from discrimination will never be able to live up to their potential. And he says this one other time in here, but our greatest resource is being wasted when that happens, and our greatest resource is the ambition and intelligence of our citizenry. Mm-hmm. That is our best resource as a country, and when people face discrimination. And these fantastically talented people don't get to live up to what they could be able to do. Mm -hmm. We all lose out. Yeah. You know, Mm. Um, I actually wrote down the Supreme Court decision that killed the the repeal of the Voting Rights Act of 2013 here. Because he talks about it again. Okay. So it was Shelby County versus Holder. And it was a landmark decision of the Supreme Court of the United States regarding the constitutionality of two provisions of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Mm. Section 5 requires certain states and local governments to obtain federal preclearance before implementing any changes to their voting laws. And Section 4B contains the coverage formula that determines which jurisdictions are subject to preclearance based on their histories of discrimination in voting. So this is what made it really easy to change these voting laws. Hmm. the repeal of this okay. and this is another aspect of institutional discrimination yes. not just personal discrimination but the way the institutions are being designed to be discriminatory sure that makes sense you know and that's hmm. what he says next that's what he says next he says we, that the, that our laws and our institutions are caked with this racism yeah and we need another civil rights act in order to start taking it off hmm cuz right now it's just it, it, it's completely it's still buried in it buried in it yeah yeah i see that so what he says to do is is he mentions affirmative action yeah um he Which says going to be killed yeah there's a supreme court case right now that is basically going to rule that colleges and universities shouldn't be allowed or won't be allowed to ask the race of applicants Completely mm. killing affirmative action. See, I, I will say, I think doing affirmative action as a place-based policy rather than race-based yeah. might be preferable. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. Listen, obviously, I would like a multivariate affirmative action policy where sure. you're counting income, race, and where you're from. Mm. But if you're not even going to take race into account, that really sucks. Yeah. Because race would definitely be the uh, strongest predictor. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that's going to be the strongest predictor. So it sucks that that's going to be taken out and affirmative action is going to be dead in America. I can't even believe that. Mm. You know? Yeah. So, it's, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, besides that, he doesn't really, uh, he says we need to, we need to increase access to education, nutrition, and health. Uh, but he doesn't really give a way to do so. I think he goes into that later, a little bit, right? A little bit. But it's he 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 has no way to solve racism, which I don't blame him for. But you know, he says we need a new civil rights act. Well, what should be in that civil rights act? Mm-hmm. More voting rights, sure. Um, more health and nutrition assistance. I agree. Um. You know, but it's a hard problem to solve, you know, and his ambiguity on that emphasizes that, I think, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, he also talks about that the burden that the future generations are going to be uh, saddled with. Um, And he specifically emphasizes the 2017 tax bill as a burden because it's not pursuing the necessary investments that are going to deprive future growth. It's we're not investing in the things like infrastructure in the 2017 tax bill, we're not investing in uh, superior technological advancements and research, you know, um, Mm -hmm. and we're going back on globalization with, and, you know, the the way that we're going to be increasing our labor rates. Yeah. So it's also increasing the deficit that will (laughs) be happening each year, which is obviously going to be increasing the national debt. Yeah. You know, and our planet is in existential danger, 
And the yes. fact that it's was completely ignored by the 2017 tax cut and the, and, and the entire Republican administration for four years, totally ignored, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, that puts a pretty big burden on future generations, I'll say. Yeah. It's not great. Not great. Not a great time to be growing up. No. And then the last thing that he talks about in the chapter is taxation. And he's like, obviously, to fund these policies, like to have a more powerful government that can exist or kind of compete more with the private sector in a way, we need to tax more. Um, he One thing he says is returns to land, which is like rent, um, should be taxed much higher. Yeah. Right now, I think it's taxed around the 22% mark. Mm-hmm. He quoted someone who said it would be completely feasible i should find this quote he said something about being a hundred taxes at a hundred percent um which i wonder about like if how would that work i have no idea uh, i don't agree with that yeah. you're gonna tax you're gonna tax all revenue based off land holdings by a hundred percent and there's no incentive to tax than, than to buy land or to develop land hmm and there's no I incentive mean, to do so. Well, it would just be that that land would be lived on by the owners. Like that would be. The what result. about commercial buildings? That's the thing. What about currently owned buildings? Well, commercial buildings could still be owned by companies. The companies that harbor them. Yeah. That would just com- all right. Well. Yeah, but then it's like, but then it's like, what about skyscrapers? Like there aren't enough people, and every at building any needs to now to... develop their own building. Every build, every company now needs to build their own building. There can't, like, yeah, you know what I'm saying, yeah, it would just reduce incentives too much on development, which is still necessary. Yeah, so I, I mean, have it be forty percent. Have it tax more than labor. Yes, obviously. Should it be a hundred percent? No, not a hundred percent. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then he talks about tax and capital gains. Capital gains taxes should be double what the labor taxes are. Yeah, obviously, the fact that ca- capital gains taxes are taxes you, uh, taxes you pay on money you make in the stock market mm-hmm. through your investments. Um, obviously, those should be taxed double what your labor is. Mm. You know, because it's rent seeking, and you know, so I I don't agree with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah Trump actually campaigned just- on getting rid of capital gains taxes really in 2016 obviously didn't talk about that once he got elected yeah capital gains is is really just like it's just playing money games it's gross in the market uh and i mean i guess you could say it's gross but also i mean a bunch of people do benefit off of it but the i would say the average person benefits by putting their money in the market and just letting it grow right over a long time well when i say it's gross i say it's gross that it's taxed lower than labor Oh, that's yeah. what I mean by it's gross. I don't yeah. think the action is gross. I think that part is gross. Okay, the fact that it's tax lower than labor is like, you really think that like we want we want an economy and a government that's going to incentivize people to sit at their laptop day trading on e trade more than going and being a firefighter? Yeah, are we going to say that that's more valuable than the latter? No, exactly. You know, so I don't I don't agree with any of the capital gains being different for labor at all. And it's interesting because the argument for like lowering capital gains taxes is it'll increase investment in the economy. But the thing is the, like the money that is invested in these companies uh, uh, often it's, it's just waiting to be ping ponged around to other companies on the exchange. Yeah, exactly. It's not actually going towards any production. No, no, it's not going to. And that's like the real fundamental cause of it. That's like the fundamental theory here. America has become a finance hub. Mm -hmm. We have, we have aged into financialization. Yeah. And we don't make things, we're not producing things, mm-hmm. and that needs to change. We need we need to start we need to encourage companies and f- in some way force companies to start investing in tangibles yeah. rather than the the fugazis. Yeah. I mean not not even I, I feel like tangibles might be a little misleading because I think about research, for example. Which, oh, right. Like, research isn't technically. I mean, re- like production of knowledge. Yeah. Just as important. Well, when I say that, well, yeah, but that's still, when I research falls into investing in tangible because you're hiring someone to research. Mm. Okay. You know what I mean? Sure. Okay. That so then he talks sense. about a decent life for all. Next chapter. Next chapter. Yes. And the fundamental principle is this markets have not done a good enough job ensuring basic needs, mm-hmm. and the government's got to step in. Yes. He talks about a public 
option, which is so funny. Like, did you read ahead? No. Because last week when we were, when we were filming, you were like, I feel like so many of these conversations just boil down to we need a public option. <laughs> and then in this chapter, he's like, we need a public option. I didn't even remember that I said that. Oh, well, or that I used that vocabulary. That's exactly. I, I don't know. if Well, what happened was you said something like the, if you had a government alternative. Yes. And that's literally what? That's exactly. That's exactly what this yeah. is. Yeah. No, when I read this, I was like, perfect. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is exactly what I believe written on paper. Yeah. So he he basically gives four different categories mm -hmm. where this needs to be. So healthcare is the first one. Public needs to be more involved in providing for healthcare. Um, I was a little bit confused here because I, I'm not... Maybe you can fill me in on wh how, what has the Affordable Care Act done? What is it missing as far as providing a public option for health care? The, well, there isn't one in it. So the Affordable Care Act mandated that every single person in the United States had to buy health insurance. The same way that you needed to buy car insurance, you need to buy health insurance. Okay. It also said that health insurance companies cannot discriminate to you based off pre-existing conditions. Hmm. Whether you have diabetes, health insurance can't say we're not going to cover you or charge you more for things like that. Then it also provided a marketplace for you to log into and find healthcare plans that will be affordable to you. And then Obamacare will, and then through the Affordable Care Act, there are subsidies in place where the government picks up a piece of the bill for you to enter the market. Okay. That's okay. what the Affordable Care Act did. It seems so terrible. Meh. It seems like, terrible. <laughs> I hate it. It just doesn't do anything. Well, I think it's awful that. <laughs> I think it's actually awful that we say, okay, I know you can't afford healthcare and it's too expensive and private insurance companies charge way too much. Mm -hmm. So how about you pay 20% and we'll pay the other 80% of this private insurance company making a shit ton of money. Yeah. Like that's what the subsidy is doing. Sure. That's not actually addressing the actual problem of it being too expensive. Yeah. You're just, you're honestly, you're subsidizing their bad behavior. Yeah. And there are some stipulations that in order to get onto the Obamacare network, the Obamacare marketplace online, you have to have some standards, mm. um, which is good. But so that's where it misses. And, um, you know, the percent of people who had health insurance after Obamacare, we're just going to go into the access for health care portion of the yep. program. So the people who had health insurance pre-Obamacare was like 84%. After Obamacare, it went to like 82%. Really? Yeah, it jumped like a, like almost a full 10%. So it was Wait, very, and then, oh, and also, 92. Yeah. You said 84 to 82. Oh, sorry. 84 to 92. Okay. And Obama and Obamacare also, I forgot to mention this part. This is also a big deal. It expanded Medicaid. So it increased okay. the amount of people who were able to sign on to Medicaid, but that had specific rollout requirements where states had to vote to do it. And a lot of Republican states never voted to do it. Mm. Um, but it went from 84 to 92. Under the Trump administration, it got worse people who lost health insurance okay. during the Trump administration. So I have this chart up here. Um, in 2020, in 2014, 8 million people were rolling on to these marketplace things through the Affordable Care Act. In 2016, it was around 12 million. By the time Trump left office, it was 11 million. Mm. And... By the time Biden is now in office, it's up to 16 million. There were policy decisions that Trump made through the, the tax, specifically the tax cut. The tax cut also removed the individual mandate on the Affordable Care Act, mm. which said that now you don't need to buy health insurance. Well, now that completely disincentivized people to go out and do it. Mm. So now they didn't do it. Under Biden, he still didn't implement that mandate, but he's increased the Obamacare subsidies so much through the American Rescue Plan Act and through the Inflation Reduction Act, then now we've been able to get up to 16 million more people. So between the years of 2016 and 2019, the majority of President Trump's current term in office, you ready? The number of Americans with health in, without health insurance jumped 2.3 million. And that loss of health care coverage led to 4,000 deaths and possibly as many as 25,000. There are incredible material consequences mm. to not prioritizing healthcare. That's insane. At least 4,000 up to maybe 25,000 deaths mm. because of this. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's horrible. It's insane. And, and, hmm. and so, and, and that, that, that's the thing, the health insurance debate, there is no Republican plan for health care. Yeah. The Republican plan for health care is you either bought insurance or you didn't. And if you didn't, too bad. Yeah. Go watch the presidential debates from 2011. You have Ron Paul arguing with Mitt Romney about health care. And Ron Paul, who was, a, who was like a very libertarian candidate, Honestly, Ron Paul is basically the party that we have today. Ron Paul, the way that Bernie Sanders kind of captured the Democrat Party's imagination in 2016, Ron Paul captured the Republican imagination in 2012. And Ron Paul said, that sucks. Like, what happens if a, if a young guy gets cancer, didn't have health insurance? That sucks. That's basically his answer. Yeah. And that's the Republican answer. That's what they believe. So, uh, oh, geez. Anyway. Yeah. So the idea is, is healthcare should be a human right. Yeah. And if it is, then the government should ensure it. Mm -hmm. It's really that simple. That simple. Um, now, Repub uh, Obama tried to get a public option. It failed specifically because of a guy named Lieberman. He was a senator. Um, mm -hmm. Joseph Lieberman. He was big time moderate. The original Joe Manchin, some would say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he absolutely killed the public option. And the public option is suggesting that anybody in America could buy into Medicare at any age. Hmm. No matter what age you are, you can buy into Medicare and you can be a part of the Medicare program, which sounds perfect. Yeah, absolutely. It's a little bit at odds with Medicare for All. Hmm. There's a little bit of a difference. Medicare for All wants to abolish all private insurance. Oh, I, I don't think... There's just no need for that. Like I if you think have a public a option, that. there isn't a need for that because it's going to it's gonna compete with the private options and they're going to be required to lower their costs or else just lose more and more customers to the government. And he uses the example of the United Kingdom yeah. as one where there is a thriving private healthcare insurance industry and government provided health insurance. Yeah. Um and I, I think there's there will probably be a niche for private health insurance to fill into, like maybe for richer, more specialized healthcare needs. Um, but generally, having a government option is, is going to be the way to go. The I only expect. thing I'm concerned about, the only thing I'm concerned about with public option versus Medicare for all is with a public option, I think that younger people who are really healthy won't want to buy into the public option. Sure. And the public option will take on all of the sickest and all of the oldest and public option. And that might make the private companies way more, way cheaper than the private, than the public option could ever be. Okay. Cause in the private companies can say, you know, we're only taking the 20 and 30 year olds because hmm. all the 50 and 60 year olds went to the public option. You know what I mean? Sure. So that's my concern with the private thing still existing, but I think the public option is an awesome place to start. Okay. Yeah. That's valid. Love the public option. Okay. Next next thing he talks about is retirement. Mm -hmm. This is um, a great example of that public-private insurance working in tandem, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically, public option for Social Security Yeah. Um, needs to be had. I was confused because I... So, because I feel like Social Security is already pretty robust. So, what exactly are the differences he's looking for here? He's looking for Social Security money. Basically, what I, what I what I talked about last time, and I kind of joked that we need a hedge fund of the United States. Yeah, that's what he's. We need the Social Security trust fund to start investing the money in S and P five hundred index funds mm. and or infrastructure bank bonds that he's referring to. And we should start making money off of our Social Security money. That's what needs to start happening. Yeah. It needs to start happening. It would help us so much. I know it exposes volatility to our Social Security system. I get that. But in the long run, it will absolutely be more <laughs> flu uh, it was so effective. Yeah. The amount of money we'll be able to generate. Totally. Totally. We just, our government needs to be willing to take a small bit of risk. It's the smallest risk. It actually is the smallest risk. I mean, you can you can literally buy the safest investments, the safest mutual funds at three exactly. percent. Yeah, you know, and you don't and with three percent return rates with no fees. Because what's so terrible right now is people have four hundred one ks and or Roth IRAs, and if you don't read the fine print, you might be charged a one percent fee 
for this co- for fidelity to manage your money. A 1% fee is so much money. If we're talking about a difference of 40 years between a 6% return over 40 years and a 7% return over 40 years, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars being given to fidelity that should have just been yours. Wow. For not even to really actively manage your account that much. A 7% growth of $100,000 compared to a 6% growth of $100,000 over 40 years, worlds of a difference. So that 1% fee, if any of you have a 401k out there, which I hope you do, or a Roth IRA, which you better, go check the fees that you're getting charged. I I, I ran through my mom's and I recently found out she was getting a 1.1% fee. And I was like, oh my God, you need to change this fund is in right now. Wow. So yeah. Damn. Okay. Super exploitive. Yeah. So Good giving people a uh, public option to that garbage <laughs> would be great. I'll be checking up on that. Yeah. Um, home ownership. Home ownership. Next. So this is probably where I was most confused. Um, he, he lays out basically a way that the IRS could be used as a mortgage provider. I love this so much. So he talks about how uh, the IRS has a database of hist- uh, historical family income um, and that it also has the data concerning housing transactions. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he says th- these are the data that would be needed to create a mortgage payment vehicle. Since the IRS have, has this, we should just fold it in. Totally. What are, you, are you confused there? I guess I'm not sure. I don't know how this, how these data work to create this mortgage oh. payment vehicle. Oh, neither do I. Okay. I don't understand the nitty gritty. Okay. That, yeah. No, I don't either. What I do understand is currently the federal government backs the vast majority of mortgages. Mm-hmm even if the mortgages are held by the private sector. Yes. So a bank gives you a mortgage, but the government backstops it if you default on that mortgage. Mm -hmm. Why should this bank be able to profit off of this if the public takes all the risk? Well, if the public is taking all the risk, time for the public to profit or time for the public to reduce the cost so much because there's no need to profit. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's housing. I'm down. Totally down. Public option for housing. Love it. All right. And then finally is education um equalize educational opportunity uh which means create availability for pre-k give access to uh colleges and universities to all reduce the amount of student debt that people have to get into to go to college Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of interest that they have to pay back which again could work through a government bank Mm -hmm. Um, he this is again where he gives the option for income contingent loans yeah. to be given for student debt. Um, I feel like I'm kind of okay with that. Yeah, I'm yeah. okay with that. Income, income contingent loans can be predatory because just interest can accumulate so fast if your income isn't high. Hmm. And if you're only paying 5% of your income to the student loan and your income is so low, you're never going to make a dent in your student loan. You're in debt forever. This is okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's an issue. Sure. But that's an issue with our current system. If yeah. it's federally backstopped, I feel like it's a little different. But also, listen, the real solution here is free public community college and then a free public college alternative. Sure. The answer is not better student loan payment plans. The answer is college is going to be free. Yeah. So, you know, and again, I want to emphasize this was a part of Biden's family plan in the beginning of his presidency, pretty much all of this. Mm. It never happened. But he tried, and I think it's so interesting. Maybe Stiglitz has been... Well, Stiglitz is a Nobel Prize ear. economist who worked in the Obama administration, right? Exactly. So I'm sure he's had his ear. Yeah. You know? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. The last chapter... Oh, wait. You know what? Last thing about schools. Go ahead. Sorry. Schools are currently funded through zip codes. Yes. The only way that this is going to be fixed with these poor with these education systems is that schools need to be funded on a state-level... And then federal level, because if we keep doing this local level funding each school district, poor schools are going to be poor forever and rich schools are going to be rich forever. And yeah. the poor kids are never going to have a shot. Mm-hmm. So He talks about how the federal government needs to incentivize the states 
to have redistributive funding yes for its public schools there you go to raise up those underprivileged areas yes okay and this this last chapter i probably i definitely read the least i have like nothing about it um it's it's very wrap up uh very rehashing everything that he's already gone over Mm -hmm. so he talks about the disparity between our values and social reality which basically says that so, oh, there are all these economists who expect that humans are selfish, uh, but people are actually good. And you see that in a lot of other ways. Um, at, at the very least, in our policies, like we value doing good with our policy. Um, but if we don't express that goodness, then we're, we sink into darkness. Uh, he talks about afterwards that our myths mask our failings this is something that i'm totally on board with Mm -hmm. um there's this idea of the american dream freedom of america the rugged individual yes the goodness of rugged individualism the badness of government aid um i'm on board with that the the narratives around the country kind of they they contribute into this rent sink seeking behavior of mm-hmm. like lift myself up as much as I can. It's okay to exploit everyone else. That's what rugged individualism is. It's right. making it for yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, again, this is the question of like, how do you do it? But shifting towards some kind of narrative of collectivism mm-hmm. is where we need to be going. But shifting the narrative seems so nebulous. Yeah. It and is. it is nebulous. Because it's it's an amalgamation of how our news talks about things on cable and in newspapers and in magazines and what we see in our movies and like it's it's everything. There is no one answer because it has to be like a wave of communication. Yeah, that leans into it. Yeah, um, and then this tension between embracing change and deep conservatism, yeah. which is big ideas like clinging to the past is bad. It clearly can't work for social policy because we don't want to be racist and sexist again um shocker doesn't work for uh healthcare policies because we've always had worse health in the past um economic policy no because we used to have much lower per capita income international policy also no because we don't dominate the world like we did after world war ii anymore so we can't pretend that we do Mm -hmm. Uh, it just doesn't and environmental policy because we can't keep exploiting our environment and destroying the earth right. so it really in every aspect like this idea of conservatism just doesn't work anymore yeah and he listen he, he talks about this narrative and this feel and this myth a lot and he says that the trump's biggest danger isn't really his policies trump's biggest because they can all be reversed trump's biggest danger is the attacks on the institutions and government authority and government officials Mm -hmm. um you know and one of the things that he really talks about a lot this time around is that he wants to remake the government deep state fire all the government bureaucrats and put his guys in there Mm -hmm. and that is right out of steve bannon steve bannon is a right-wing talk radio host right out of steve bannon's playbook he's a very far-right populist figure and it's it's about a, it's about an administ it's like about a, a capture of the state here, yes you know, yeah it's totally making it inoperable, yeah which is frighteningly authoritarian frighteningly authoritarian, and he's saying it publicly and people cheer when he says that yes he wants to undermine public institutions I think along with like his attacks on media and judiciary really fit in alongside that like it's it. It is undermining the checks and balances yeah. uh, to beef up the power of the executive. Totally. Um, he mentioned some silver linings, like our international partners see Trump and they decide they don't like him. I was skeptical on this because you, you look at a Boris Johnson or several of the other right-wing movements that you already mentioned that are happening in Europe. And yeah. I, I don't know if, I don't know, it doesn't seem to me like they're leaning away from the trump i mean i don't movement. really i don't really i don't know i mean yeah. if anything i feel like europe is now like almost pivoting to china in a lot of ways because of america's um unpredictability yeah I, yeah europe seems open to china right at least a lot of countries portugal greece for sure hmm. a lot of countries are 
open. Italy's open. Well, Italy less so now that the last election, but other countries seem more open to China yeah. than the U.S. And I don't. That's not a good development at all. And that's mm. because of Trump. Yes, definitely. Um, so he says silver linings, but then he's like, "Oh, there are also these dark clouds on the horizons," which it seems directly contradictory because. Basically, his point here is that Trump has provided this lightning rod of bigotry for other people to exploit. Yeah. And you're like, oh, it's okay to be this way because look at how he's this way. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And so, I I don't know. I didn't, I don't have much more. The the last thing I have is this whole book can be summed up by one idea that we need to promote the general welfare. Um, We need an agenda on fostering progress, and that has a deep understanding on the sources of wealth of the nation. Mm -hmm. And the sources of the wealth are good organizations, good organizational capacity, and technological advancement. Mm -hmm. Government's reputation of being slow and inefficient needs to be broken. All human institutions have their issues, especially those in the market. And what's unique about government institutions is that we have the power to vote and change them. We don't have the power to vote and change the market, but we have the power to vote and change the government. And we should take advantage of that. Mm-hmm. And the last thing he says is that young people have not lost their idealism yet, and they're the hope. And that ends our reading of Stiglitz. Yes. People, power, and profits. Wow. Um, what did you think? <laughs> so we talked about this a little bit before we got on the pod. Um, when it comes down to it, it it's pretty generic. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like a book for a 16 year old. Yes. Like who, who maybe has heard from their parents a little bit on politics, but hopefully it's like for someone who has a completely clean mind to politics. It's yeah. like, let me, let me tell you how things work. Uh-huh. Um, but it doesn't really go that it, it goes in depth a mildly in depth on the problems yeah um like i i feel very like it helped it it did it explained wealth inequality income inequality rent seeking yeah uh, as problems extremely well yeah uh but even like once you get into the more specifics how we got there like i think the globalization the finance financialization maybe was a strength of a chapter yeah but globalization and the the impacts of technology kind of seemed all over the place Mm -hmm. it didn't give me a really solid grasp i agree and then the the solutions that we just described bare bones very bare bones it's like these are the ideas but you don't get into the implementation at all and it's it's kind of like oh they sound good but someone with kind of any inkling of skepticism i think is going to read this and going to be hard to believe it just because it sounds like someone who was in the Obama administration. It sounds like someone who's deeply anti-Trump, who has whose biases are coming through in the writing. And yeah. so as I read that, I'm like, okay, these could be good ideas, but I will have to do a lot more reading into to them. To check and make sure that these things are accurate. And he, listen, he cites all of his sources, yeah. a lot of references. I, I checked a, a lot of them. They're mm-hmm. great. But I, I don't think that I just, I don't think this book gave the details necessary to really chart out an agenda the way that he kind of wanted this book to be. He really emphasized that he wants this book to be like a progressive Bible that you can take with you and say, this is what I believe. Mm-hmm. It's just not like that. It no. doesn't have, it doesn't have the same, it, do, it doesn't have a blueprint. And well, you know what? It's like, it, it's like taking an anatomy class, but you only learn about the skeleton. Sure. You know? Okay. You don't know like how everything works on top of that. And you don't know about, the, the hiccups that might come up with implementing such a policy. Yeah. He doesn't ever talk about the hiccups. He never says, this is what we need to do, but there is this issue that we need to address. Yes. He just says, this is what we need to do. Yes. Or, or if he does say there's this issue we need to address, he doesn't necessarily address it. True. He just says there's this problem and that, but he still is like, but, but we should still probably go towards this policy. Right. Like how did, did something go wrong? No, it's still. Oh, I think it's still okay. It okay. just was a low battery. Oh, okay. Recording. Okay. Which hopefully won't. Tell me when you ready. You want to angle it a little differently? Yeah, I think. Okay. Three, two, one. 
So I, I just don't think that the book is detailed enough to really be able to chart out a whole agenda. Yeah. I can't. think it was a good introduction for a liberal minded person. Mm -hmm. But if you're even slightly conservative, you're never going to read this. Exactly. Ever. Yeah. If you have any prior political opinions, it doesn't do anything. It, does it doesn't move the needle. No. Yeah. But what this book is notable is it seems to be a direct response to the Trump tax cuts. Look at you. I know, right? Look at you. Look how good I am. Wow. Which leads us into our next segment where we do a little bit of a deep dive onto the Trump tax cuts, specifically uh, the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. This is what we're going to go into specifically. Okay, so we read a paper from the Dallas Federal Reserve, which um, gave us a gave a lot of interesting insights, um, with a lot of great sources referenced throughout that we're gonna be uh, that that we're gonna go into. But first, let's give a little breakdown of what the Trump tax cuts did. So first, it increased, it, it decreased tax rates from basically almost every bracket. The 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 first bracket from zero dollars to ten thousand dollars stayed at ten percent. Mm -hmm. Nine thousand to forty thousand, fifteen to twelve. Uh, forty thousand to ninety thousand, twenty five to twenty two. Ninety thousand to two hundred thousand, twenty eight to twenty four, and so on and so forth. And the marginal rate went down went went down from forty to thirty seven. So generally, taxes went down across the board, mm -hmm. but more most of the tax of this bracket reorganization benefits the most wealthy in a lot of ways here. Do you think so? So that was something I was curious about because mm -hmm. that's how it kept being described, mm -hmm. but I'm seeing this, this decrease from 15% to 12% on 10,000 to, to 40,000 mm -hmm. seems very significant yeah. for that bracket, right? I'm seeing the same from 40,000 to 90,000. These are, these are decreases that, that seem to, be working for the middle class. This doesn't. This this these marginal changes doesn't take into account the um, differences in tax deductions that people were allowed to take. But so this limited the number. So another thing of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was it eliminated um, a lot of possible deductions for state and local taxes that people were able to take advantage of previously. Okay, interesting. Because yes. it also it increased the standard deduction. Yes, it did also increase standard deduction. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Like, I'm curious whether those specific itemized deductions, were they more beneficial to the middle class and working class? Well, because the standard deduction, I think, was it as was around doubled from something like 6,500 to over 12,000. I'm going to I'm going to cite this. This is a research paper with um, by David Weiner. He, he, he's the main author. The effect of the Tax Cup and Jobs Act, individual income tax provisions across income groups and across the states. I'm going to read through a little bit of the abstract here. Mm -hmm. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will reduce individual income taxes on average for all income groups in all states. Unlike prior tax policy center reports, this analysis focuses on the distribution of the individual income tax changes and does not include changes in the corporate income tax, excise taxes, or estate and gift taxes. It will also extend the analysis of blah, 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 and then we go here. We estimate that in 2018, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act will cut individual income taxes for 65% of households overall, but will raise taxes for about 6% of households. Only 27% of households in the lowest income quintile will receive a tax cut, with most having no material changes in their taxes, the individual income tax cuts as a percentage of after-tax income will be largest for high-income households, particularly those in the 95th to 99th percentile of the income distribution, and we estimate that between 60 and 76% of taxpayers in every state will receive a tax cut. Mm. The ind yeah, so it, we're saying that the lowest the, the lowest income people are not receiving a tax cut. The middle class is receiving a modest tax cut and the upper class is receiving a large tax cut. Hmm. I'm curious. I don't, I don't understand to be honest. It's okay. I, I'm worried that I'm not going to be informed enough for this discussion. No, it's all right. But I'll try. Um, okay. So, so, Maybe so. It does say twenty-seven percent of the lowest quintile did have their taxes decreased. Yeah, so that's something. Something. 
Um, but the biggest deductions are going to the highest earners. And I assume that's because of this, this 3% percentage point drop in the highest bracket. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're, it's not just that. We're talking about we're also we, he changes the estate taxes as well. So incomes that exceed 11.2% are now subject to 11.2 million. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. 11.2 million are subject to a 40% estate tax at time of death. It used to be 5.6. Mm-hmm. So now we, we were talking about in Stiglitz about how the transition, the transmission of wealth, mm-hmm. this is a huge now hit to that where the transmission of wealth is becoming a lot easier for the richest. Yes. You know? Yeah. That's fair. Um, so next thing you have here, I see corporate tax rate. Yeah, corporate tax rate. Yeah. So and that's a huge one. This I dug into a little bit. I think you have 39 here. I thought it was 35. Uh, I think something around there. I don't know. It went from 35% down to 21%. Yeah. Um, this is on corporate profits. Mm-hmm. Trump wanted it to be 15%, ended up getting it at 21%. You say that many could go down to zero because like of Netflix tax credits. Like Netflix paid zero, Amazon paid zero. Yeah. Some of the biggest uh, corporations in America were able to pay no income to corporate income taxes uh, because of the deductions they were able to take through the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Yeah, that makes sense. And so this this part I looked into a little bit because I, I was learning, I was hearing that the corporate tax change was kind of the meatiest part of yeah. the tax code change. And the idea was that because we are taxing corporations too much, we're driving them away from America. Mm-hmm. And we need to uh, reinvigorate investment in America by reducing the corporate income tax rate. Right. I read a paper that was saying, that said that... Um, Investment did increase, specifically investment, private investment with retained earnings mm-hmm. um, significantly increased. And it was like additional investment from say, exogenous entities or companies that uh, were not internal, so not retained earnings. Right. That wasn't really moved mm-hmm. by the tax cuts. Um, but increasing investment, like... I want to I want to try to be as impartial as possible. Here. Yeah, of course. Like that seems good. good. That seems helpful. Yeah. And look, I, I think 39% corporate income tax rate was too high. You know, I think that that I think that was bad policy. I think that the the, the with Biden's new inflation Re- reduction act having a 15% minimum tax for any corporation exceeding $1 billion of profits reported. That's great. Mm. I think that's great. But okay. that's going to tax more out of Amazon and tax more out of Netflix that are maybe you're investing in tangibles per se. Sure. You know, I know that the tax cut in, inspired or, or caused a lot of stock buybacks and stuff, which is not what we want to see. Mm. Um, but there was definitely more investment. And as we'll get into, there was GDP growth because of the tax cut and jobs act. Yes. It was not all bad mm-hmm. there. It, it did do something, mm-hmm. um, you know, and so this paper written by the, the Dallas Fed, it starts off by, 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 by showing that previous multipliers to tax cuts are estimated to be around 1 to 3.5. Now, what's a multiplier? A multiplier is change in GDP growth. Mm-hmm. So he was like, previous literature suggests that tax cuts will have a 1% or a 3.5 multiplier to GDP. Mm. Where in that realm did the Tax Cut and Job Act fall? Was it in one? Was it closer to 3.5? Where did it fall? Well, weak economic activity, in eras of weak economic activity, in times of recession, that's when a tax cut is super effective. That's when a tax cut is going to be able to get you to that 3.5 number, probably mm. on the upper end of that multiplier. Um, but he suggests that it's on the lower end. And the main finding is that um, there was a 1.1 1. 1 per, for, okay, the main finding is that tax shocks equaling 1% of GDP, so with a 1% reduction of GDP um, in tax in tax collected, that led to a 1.3 percentage point faster job growth and a 1.5 percentage point higher GDP growth. Um, that's a fairly positive development mm-hmm. um, with 1.5% GDP growth, you know, being added on top of what was expected. 
That's great. Yeah. Um, well, when you average that out, that's one thousand a one hundred and five thousand dollars per job and a multiplier of one point five. Mm. That one hundred and five thousand dollars per job number, I think, is important. Yeah. Um, did you have any analysis suggested? Like, how did you did you have any metric to think like is that number good or bad? I mean, so one hundred five thousand dollars per job. I'm I'm thinking if we're equally distributing here, it means it means jobs should be making one hundred five thousand dollars. Oh no no no, per. that's not what that means though. I know it's not what it oh. ends up happening as. Right. Because it ends up going to the top. Right. Which is the issue. Yes. But that's kind of my first, my, my initial thought. And then you need further analysis to determine how much did trickle down. Right. And the answer is almost certainly none, very yeah. little. Um, so something I've done in my free time, because I'm a nerd, was I've been I, like a year ago I've been I've been accumulating this big document mm. and I've been studying the effects of 2008 stimulus package um uh and <laughs> that's awesome I know so I in the CBO report the Congressional mm. Budget Office report of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act um the cost per job was $45,000 mm. Um, in 2017 dollars, that's fifty one thousand dollars. So, one hundred five thousand dollars per job in the Tax Cut Job Act, fifty one thousand dollars in the stimulus package. Hmm. Government spending versus tax cut cost half as much per job. Now, the 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 environmental difference is that the stimulus package was done during recession, mm -hmm. so any multiplier is going to be higher than a tax cut done in a time of economic boom. But then this challenges the question, was this the right time to do a tax cut? Sure. Was this the right time to do a tax cut? Because what is the opportunity cost of all the money that the government now doesn't have? Yes, we had 1.5% GDP growth, which is that can be accounted for this, which is good. And we had 1.3 million more jobs, which is great. But was that the best way to use that money? Would sure. have going into more research increased productivity more? Mm -hmm. And these are the questions we have to ask. And I, and I think that you know his methodology in the in the paper is actually really great. If you're interested in math and econometrics, I recommend you to go read the Dallas analysis of the Federal Reserve. I'm not going to go into the all the 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 metrics and the analysis methodology here because that'd be more boring than it already is. But um, it's really cool stuff. Hmm. It's really cool stuff, the way he was able to figure it all out. Yeah, it's interesting because I did read a, a paper from from Brookings. Um, one thing that that he said, I, I forget the, the main author of the paper that we're talking about. Um, yeah, I forgot his name too. But, terrible for that. But there was, a, there was another paper in Brookings that, that kind of teased this out in a different way. And I, I'm not good enough at following the math unfortunately, mm -hmm. to determine which, like to, to make a statement on which I believe, but the Brookings article said that the GDP increases can largely be accounted for by changes in oil prices, which interestingly enough was specifically yes. teased out as a factor in this paper yes. as something that was not the reason for these GDP increases. And instead the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act should have been given credit for so the you're GDP saying increases. you're saying that the, the the Brookings study said that the tax cuts didn't contribute a lot to the GDP growth a lot of it was due to oil yes so this Dallas report actually factor he, he includes oil in his mm -hmm. model for GDP growth to pull it so he he, he controls for oil prices yeah he controls for oil production mm -hmm. um, and he even controls for state by states so, so states that are more reliant on natural gas, he makes a note of that. Yes. Or states more reliant on oil, he makes a note of that in his model. Yeah. So he takes into account that Brookings, what, and challenges Brookings' findings. Exactly. And says, to, so you're telling me that Brookings said tax cut not that effective. And then Dallas Club, Dallas Fed says, you know what? Kind of is even despite oil. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. And the Brookings paper specifically says like, Oil sees the biggest returns, the biggest increases, and the returns on everything else are kind of negligible. The growth in all these other sectors is negligible. Interesting. It is very interesting. Um, 
I totally had something else. The the other main point that I had looked into is the idea with these corporate tax cuts yeah. was going to be, a, it's supposed to be a supply side effect. So right. it's like, because there's lower corporate tax rates, there's more investment, which means there's more production and supply that comes into the country. Yes. And studies that I read briefly skimmed, but at least figured out the abstract said that it probably didn't change anything on the supply side. Mm-hmm. And instead the economic gains likely came from the income tax reductions, yes. which re- which raised demand. Exactly. And that's that I'm so glad you said that because that leads to the last paper I looked at for this um, by Owen Zidar. And this is great. Um, and in the, in at the end of his abstract, he says, I find that the positive relationship between tax cuts and employment growth is largely driven by tax cuts for lower income groups, that the effect of tax cuts for the top 10% on employment growth is relatively small. Mm. And I think that's really great. I think it's because that's demand. That's demand side economics because the people at the lower end are more likely to spend their income than the higher ones than the people at the higher uh, income brackets. So tax cuts for lower and middle income people are actually a really effective way to drive economic growth in times of recession. Now, am I going to say that I'm always going to be in favor of middle class and lower class tax cuts at every turn? Maybe for lower class, but not really for middle. I think mm. I think tax revenue is a good thing to have because I think the government can spend money in good ways, um, really beneficial ways. Um, but in times of recession, Middle class and lower class tax cuts should be a prime component of any stimulus package going forward. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think it, I think what we see out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is the Dallas Federal Reserve says 1.3% multiplier to GDP, not too big mm-hmm. for a tax cut. Brookings says really not that much um, uh, effect. We see that product uh, that production didn't really increase too much from the corporate tax cut, um, and what this goes to show you is that this was more of an ideological thing than a true utilitarian thing. They didn't they didn't really, you know they they, they oh and another yeah they 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 didn't uh, this wasn't so, maybe like the goal of this thing wasn't solely desire to spur production, it was inspired for capital gain, sure. You know what I mean? Sure. I mean, I don't know. What do you think about that? I, I think it was both. I think it it really, this is a perfect example of like when I learn more about something, it becomes much, much more nuanced to me. Of course. Because like you read Stiglitz and it's just like this bad. Yeah. This act is a problem. Yeah. Um, And I think as I learn more about this and I learned, okay, it does reduce income tax rates for the lower brackets. Mm-hmm. It... Like, okay, there is, like, I can I can see an argument for trying to, for lowering the corporate tax rate to incentivize investment. And the problem is that there, that trickle down doesn't work. But if we can, if we can maybe institute some other policies that, that yeah. force a greater distribution of comp- of corporate income within a company. Yeah. Like, like, I do still want companies to be investing on U.S. soil. Totally. Um, it does have, it did double the child tax credit. He did, Trump did want to increase the earned income tax credit. So it's, even if there are, um, there are problems with it. Like, I don't like that there, the tax on the top bracket decreased 3%, three percentage points. Yeah. That's a problem. I think that should go up. Um, but there there are good things here and it yep. just like it needs it needs tweaks um adjustments i think the biden ira minimum corporate tax rate of 15 percent is a perfect example mm-hmm. of one that um that really fixes a major loophole left in the trump tax cuts totally but good and bad i think you know they're going to be voting on it at some point soon in some many years they're going to be voting on whether or not to extend the Trump cuts for the middle and low income people, mm. whether to extend it further into the future. Um, and w- what the, the Trump tax cuts made the, the, the cuts for low income sunset and the high income permanent. 
So we need to now pass again to lower the tax to keep the tax rates on the lower and middle income lower. Mm. Um, and I think that I think that's a really great summary of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I, I think that was really good. Beautiful. Let's call it. Let's call it. All right. Um, next week. <laughs> We can just edit it that. <laughs> what? <laughs> what timing? <laughs>